Yes, yes, y'all, it's going down right now. Episode 71 of the 22 Shots of Moods and Horrors coming at you live. I am your host, Moods, a.k.a. Mr. Yuck. And of course, I've always got my main homie with me, my compadre. Even though sometimes he can be a pain in the culo. <laughs> JP, a.k.a. the Mexican Sweatshop McMaster Minder. And you know what? We're very, very proud. Both of us are very proud to welcome a first timer to the show, Matt, aka you and your horror movies. What's oh, up? Oh, you and your horror movies. <laughs> what up, everybody? Yes, my my movies. <laughs> I love your name so much. But don't explain how you got your name until now until later in the show. But your name right. is awesome. It's so oh, yeah. good. I've always liked like, your name too. I, I've always liked saying it's like you and your horror movies. Yeah. <laughs> it's so I always good. picture it as like a nineties cartoon, like wait till your father gets home or something like that, you know? <laughs> Every time I talk to Brandon, he'll sit there and be like, you and your horror movies or you and your whatever blank movies. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is going on, Matt? How about you tell the viewers at home a little bit about yourself and how we know you? All right. Well, I started YouTube maybe a couple years ago, I want to say. Just by watching everybody else's videos, I thought, hey, if they can do it, why not me? I have a huge collection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have a big collection. I love watching horror. Uh, I usually don't get a chance to talk to much people about horror until uh, I think it was uh, Jeremy got me into the uh, 22 Shots of Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started knowing you guys from the Facebook page. And then I started doing videos and reviews. And I remember, I think you, Moods, asked me to start doing some, like, a backup for the uh, Body Bags channel. Yeah, yeah. And my first review was uh, Mega Shark versus Mecha Shark. <laughs> that totally makes sense. And that's, yeah, that's totally you. <laughs> that it, says that everything about well. that <laughs> right yes. there. Yeah. Everyone knows I love my creature features. That's what I know everybody picks on me for. Uh, I love the monster movies. I love nature run amok films. I put those ahead of slashers. I love slashers, don't get me wrong. But anything else is kind of like a side deal for me. But as long as it has a kick-ass monster or if it's a nature run amok film, I am there with the popcorn in hand, a soda, beer, whatever is in my other hand, the remote's between my legs, and I'm watching this motherfucking movie. <laughs> there you go. I remember when uh, I was talking to somebody and they were like, mosquitoes getting announced on Blu-ray. Uh, by uh, Synapse or whatever, and somebody in the chat was like, dude, Matt's going to be stoked. I'm like, wait a minute, motherfucker. Like, I'm going to be stoked. <laughs> so you even stole my shine on the killer insects, which I've always, you know, said that I was a big fan of, even though most of them are bad. Uh, so I know that you like the killer insect genre as well, Nature Run Amok oh, yes, style. I do. I got a ton of them. People keep asking me, do you have this film? I go, yeah, I got this movie. It's about killer worms. And they're like, what? There's actually a movie about killer worms? There's like, a movie yeah, about killer any, everything. Yeah, I said, I even have a movie about killer slugs called Slugs. And the movie's actually really good. Yeah, they're like, oh, they roll their eyes at me and they walk away. But with you guys, I can uh. see it. And everyone's like, yeah, that movie was awesome. Remember the exploding head? I'm like, yep. <laughs> slugs has some great kills in it. I love that film. Yeah, oh, me too. Total eighties creature. Oh, it's so great. Yeah, when that slug like mm -hmm. when it shows it like bite, like when its cartoony ass mouth is like oh yeah chomps, it's <laughs> hilarious. The guy's yeah, <laughs> oh, it's so great. It's so great. Something yeah, that it's got the good gore to it too. It's got a lot of blood oh, to yeah. it. It's got yeah. a lot of everything. And mm -hmm. that's the difference between like the sci-fi channel movies of today versus the the 80s creature yeah like oh, yeah sex is all practical because there was no cgi back then oh yeah yeah it's a big difference man everything is just oh it just you know your eyes can tell right away that's not right yep you know and it's just it that's the thing about yeah. practical effects that just makes it so much better it's just you know right away you're like that's not right and you know yeah, that's what separates the films. I almost admire you and Matt for being able to watch a lot of those, you know, made for sci-fi channel movies of today where it's, you know, terrible CGI and terrible acting because you guys seem like you genuinely enjoy you're enjoying the time when I'm mm -hmm. just like why am I torturing myself like yeah, I yeah. should totally turn this off but I got to sit through it because I watch everything to the very end and it's weird because some people I I think 
really do enjoy those movies and I just don't know how. You know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, going into it that you can't take it serious. And I just really, I, you know, I just kind of rely on that. I'm, you know, I pop it in, you know, crack a beer and just kind of have fun with it and laugh at it. Like we know that most of these films are pretty shitty. You get the odd, pretty decent one. That's actually decent. (laughs) I'm not going to say good or great. I'll use the word decent. So what you're saying is you have to be intoxicated. Uh, No, 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 no. I'm hardly say, ever intoxicated. I wouldn't watching. say fully intoxicated, but no. I mean, some of these films, yeah. I mean, honestly, watching some of these films, you know, a little bit uh, inebriated is actually pretty fun. But no, you don't have to be. Like, Matt doesn't have to be, so. Hmm. But I'm actually sober most of the time watching my movies anyway. But yeah, with too. these sci-fi channel films, you got to take it as a comedy. You got to take it, you know you're going to get bad acting. You're going to get B, C list celebrities in these movies that... They fell off the face of the earth, and all of a sudden they're fighting a giant squid, or they're fighting some kind of <laughs> think, stupid shark. And you're like, yeah. Okay. I think that's what the main thing for me, though, is it's just the ideas that they're coming up with. Like when I when I first heard that they were doing a film called Sharknado, <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. And all I wanted to do was just see what they were going to do with these sharks in a tornado. You know, it's just ridiculous ideas. You know, these mashup films like yeah, well, Piranha my, Conda. Like, I you know, was like raised a little bit when I heard Sharknado. I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like Lava Lanch and, like, you know, like Shark. Oh, there's just so many combinations and stuff. And it, it brings a smile to my face every time because it, it truly makes me think on how these films actually get made. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it really does blow my mind. And I'm like, wow, like this movie actually got made. And I'm sitting in my house in the comfort of my own house watching this piece of shit. It's awesome. They're like the it, Roger Corman's of the, you know, new millennium or whatever. Well, it, the funny thing is back in the day, Roger Corman did, you know, practical effects. And now it's kind of funny when you watch new Roger Corman films, which Matt can probably vouch for this. He just jumped on that like TV sci-fi CG mm-hmm. bandwagon and just kept rolling with it. <laughs> his films are actually a lot of fun. If you watch one of his <laughs> older films, like Up from the Depths, it was this weird ass shark fish thing. Yeah, that you yeah. could definitely tell was fake, and you're like, "Wow!" But then you watch something like Lava Lantula, and you know it's a bad CGI, but you're glued to it because you're watching, and you're laughing. The kid from the fucking Sandlot was in this movie, and you're just uh, like, yeah. "Wow!" <laughs> Which but kid? the funny thing is, though, with the sci-fi <laughs> movies the replay value is actually well done. You can sit there and be like, oh yeah, I remember this film. I'll watch it again. And you just sit there and go, oh yeah, I remember that stupid scene. Oh, then here's a scene that made me laugh and you still chuckle. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's just like a totally different mind state set you have to be in. I think when you're watching these things and, you know, of course they're not for everybody. You know, it's just, you know, they're very comedic and over the top and ridiculous. And, but I think that's what kind of, I like it sometimes. Like, I was talking about on the cast, I think it was the last week or the week before JP when I was saying that I was watching a lot of really serious movies and then I had to pop in, you know, Class of Newcomb High Part 2 just to kind of, you know, I needed something to smile and laugh at. Yeah, you know, sometimes I, like, I can't remember if we talked about it on the show or in the pregame or postgame. <laughs> it, actually, it actually was on the show. Okay. And I just, I needed to, I'd watch like four or five, like, like straight serious films with like no comedy elements at all. And I was like, fuck, man, I need something to kind of, you know, kind of bring me back down to earth here. And I just started laughing at this film. I was having such a blast. But I think that's kind of what these are. You know, they're just, they're just, they kind of sit over here and you're like, okay, pop them on, you have fun with them. And then you just kind of move on or you go back to him apparently like matt does and you know, <laughs> with all the replay yeah. value that some of these roger corman made for tv films have dino shark and yeah. fucking oh my god i i still think one of my favorite parts in a in one of these tv you know shark i think it's giant uh octopus versus mega shark or whatever and the shark jumps out of the water and fucking uh eats the plane it's the plane <laughs> I, I literally had to pause the movie i was laughing so fucking hard I was pissed at myself. Like that was the single most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in a film in my life. But it didn't sh- it, like it shocked me. But then I just like, of course that happened. Of course. You, you know what, man? I, I feel what you guys are saying, and like I said, I admire it, and I wish that I could do it, but I, I just can't. I, I don't really like them. I don't see them the way that you guys do. I, I like stuff like Frankenfish, where it it actually feels like it was is an, a legit attempt at a film, and, and it kind of harkens back to stuff like Mosquito and Ticks yeah. that were kind of made for sci-fi or you know directed video of of the '90s, because these films are just it feels like there's a little more care put into them. And I but can Frankenfish notice it right is away. a sci-fi channel movie. I know, and it's the one of the rare exceptions of one that I actually <laughs> like. But these like Mega Shark versus Crocosaurus and stuff. 
I, I can't watch them. I don't even buy them. I don't even turn them on because I know I'm going to be tortured watching them. But I understand why you, some people like it. I could see like sort of the mentality behind it. Just really not for me. But, you know, moving on from that, one thing that I wanted to mention also is this is actually not the first time Matt has done podcasting because uh, – he actually a little 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 short lived show that I did in an off season of the twenty two shots one time called a double shot of horror. I mentioned it on this show before, but it was basically a concept where I took two films that had a similar theme and we reviewed them. You know, hence double shot of horror. Matt, do you remember which episode you was on and what we yes, talked I do. about? Oh yeah, it was I think the very first episode, and we did hood horror, where we did tales from the Tales from uh, the hood. Oh God! Yes, tales from the hood. The yeah, brain's fried. And hood rat. AK uh, hood rat. Tara. Yeah, Tara. There. Pretty much. Uh, ben in the hood. Yeah, Willard <laughs> in the hood. Ben in the hood. Willard in the hood. Yeah, it was a legit like remake of like Ben or Willard. <laughs> yes. But in it was the actually hood. not bad of a rap film. I never heard of it before until you told me to to we're doing that one. So I'm like, all right, I'll find it, pick it up, and uh, I liked it. It was good. I and believe I I did it on my second on my killer rat. You did, you, you did it on a rat week. I remember. I think it was on the second one I, when I called it the squeakle. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but yeah, I remember watching it going, "This is fucking Ben in the Hood, man." This yeah. Is like- it's awesome. Actually, not too, too bad. But I think the one thing that kind of surprised us all in that episode was, you know, I already knew that it was good. But to actually discuss it was how amazing Tales from the Hood really is with the social commentary. And I think that film gets a bad rap simply because it's called Tales from the Hood. It's like it's like a spoof or a satire. But it has so much depth to it. And I know that people who've never seen it are probably like, what the hell is this guy talking about? It's called Tales from the Hood. Well, they're immediately probably thinking that the Wayans brothers did this film. And they're yes. Not seriously. Yep. <laughs> but it's a very yeah. solid movie with a great – it's a, a great, great anthology – Great uh, wraparound story, great ending. The, all the segments are good. Honestly, they are. Yep. There's racism and classism and all these different isms in it. And the wraparound story is great. Yeah, it's, it's like a cool wraparound story and it's got an awesome soundtrack. Oh, yeah. It's, it's sure. like the full deal, man. Yeah, it yep. is. It, it's just unfortunate that nobody can really get a hold of it because it's out of print. But, I mean, it, it was on YouTube last time I checked. If you've never seen Tales from the Hood, please do yourself a favor and check it out. That was a lot of fun that night, Matt. And ever since then, I was like, dude, we have to get Matt on one of the 22 <laughs> Shots shows because, you know, he did so well on that show and we had such a good time. We actually had you planned for an episode last season i believe but towards the end of the season we sort of our schedules were getting jumbled and you have a rough time getting off work and and able to record with us so it kind of got effed up do you remember what we were supposed to do back then for the 22 man i have no idea no i don't remember (laughs) anything we might not even let him know what the title was (laughs) no i think it was just like a, a big surprise you're like hey we're gonna do never mind okay it was because like I, we had a bunch of shows planned towards you know the, basically it would have been the end of the second season leading into the summer because we kind of take off the summer because we're just really really busy and things like that. But um, I know it was in there, but I can't remember like any of the shows. I don't think we ever ended up doing any of those shows. No, the only one that we like, Did we? we had the invasion of the body snatchers show planned. Yeah, uh, there was we like had a couple or other ones, and one of the one of them was the top ten of 1968, which we kind of ended on that one. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did surprise people with a couple summer extravaganzas. Yeah, the Jaws <laughs> and Mad Men and things. Yeah, there was, there was, those were fun. <laughs> those were fun and stuff. So. They were fun listening to, too. Yeah. The jo- you guys the- never listened to that? Listen to the show. Trust me. It's fun to watch. <laughs> the, Jaws one, the Jaws show was so much fun to do because I hadn't watched the Jaws sequels in so, so long. But I thought that was going to be yeah. a lot more fun watching them than it turned out being because I had never – I'd only seen the first one and it's such a classic. But sometimes like, those are the best shows though. Like they're not like really the funnest to rewatch. I, actually, part three is a, is a blast. I think two is pretty boring. Four is just ridiculous. But there's so much fun to talk about because – I don't know, man. It's just kind of ridiculous what, and what lots, the, lots of funny moments. And what was the sloggiest episode for you, Modes? Like in terms of franchises, the one that was just like a pain to sit through in terms of watching. Um, you know, honestly, that was 
being only four movies in the franchise, two of them were pretty abysmal. Um, you know, I, I thought going into Children of the Corn was going to be probably the worst one, but I don't know, man. I actually had a lot of fun with that, even Me though it was like nine films. I, they and went that, by fast, dude. <laughs> they did. And the thing about the, those type of films is that they're they're short enough. Yeah. You know, and so, you, you know, you don't totally feel like you're wasting like your whole fucking day watching like two movies. You know, they're short enough that it's not so, so bad. But um, I don't know, man. I, I think maybe Warlock. <laughs> I like is, the first film. Warlock I like the 1 first and 2 film. were awesome. <laughs> I, yeah, they I were. Don't, I don't dislike Warlock 2. You know, no, I, I don't mind it. But, you know, it wasn't great. Part 3 was just so abysmal that. Yeah. Oh, my God. It, it was just the Hall so, of Pain. And that's only three, you know, that's a trilogy right there. But I can't really think of too many other ones that really... Mine is Silent Night, Deadly Night. I mean, oh, those you... were uh, such a chore to get through. There was only, what, seven, I think? But you know what? even by the remake... I agree. Like, I gave the remake a positive review, but I cannot even think... I, I, like, it does not sound appealing to go back and rewatch that film. And, you know, five I actually liked, but I think I was just so done with the other ones that I found something in five that I liked. Four was awful. Three was awful. Two I've learned to love, but at the time was awful. And, of course, one was great, but <laughs> that was just such a hard show. Plus, it was around the holidays. I think that's the thing with that franchise, that two is just you know, really easy to laugh at part three is really, really bad. Part four is really bad. And then part five is like a decent film, but then you kind of end up liking it because part three and four were so shitty. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think that's kind of like how it goes when you watch those in a row. And, you know, I'd stated before, like I'd watch these films a couple times previous to doing this show and it was a struggle. So yeah, I totally changed it. Definitely Silent Night, Deadly Night for the, the hardest one to get through. I actually forgot about that, but remember how much I was complaining about it? I was like, oh my God, like this is terrible. Yeah, <laughs> I do so remember get... in the group chat you was oh, complaining a lot and just uh, terrible. Yeah. So uh, honestly, you know, in terms of like girth of a franchise and films and stuff, it's probably one of the worst major franchises out there. I mean, technically there's six films in the franchise and there's really only good one good film. Yeah, well, there's that's a remake, not a good right? ratio. Seven films, right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, no, that's six. six. It's still six. Yeah, yeah there's six. So one out of, one out of six films. That's a bad. It's, ratio it's actually because... like five and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the other one is technically the first one all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. So, what I want to do here, I just want to kind of mix it up a little bit. Never done this with a guest before, but oh, pre-show, I just I came up with this little game. It's a little cliche, but I thought it would be pretty fun. Just you know, I got five questions for you. I'm gonna give you like 20 seconds to answer these. All right. So, so basically, you know, first thing comes to mind just to answer the questions. They're very simple. They're horror related, so you know, just very very simple questions. All right, you ready to go? Let's do it. All right, we'll start with a very very easy one. Favorite horror film of all time? Uh, favorite horror of all time? Uh, the Thing remake, John Carpenter. Number two, favorite franchise? Uh, Friday the 13th. Number three, favorite villain? Favorite villain? Harry Warden from My Bloody Valentine. Nice. Uh, number four, favorite subgenre? Subgenre? Uh, creature features. And number five, favorite fast food joint? Taco Bell. <laughs> nice. Hey, Matt, did you try the new sliders, yo? No. <laughs> oh, dude, sliders. they're so good. They, they talk about sl- the Taco sliders, Bell. dude, they're oh, so crazy. good. I love That's them. So crazy. That's it's like so- Taco Bell, my first one, and of course, KFC would be number two. <laughs> I always talk about Taco Bell, man, how it just rots the shit out of my guts. I can't eat it, love man. It. Oh. Love it. <laughs> love it. There's actually a place near me that a Taco Bell and a KFC together. I'm like, I've oh yeah, yeah. Fuck, I can get a quesadilla and mashed potatoes. We've got and this be like, here. All right. <laughs> this is like so funny, man. I can shit my brains out and eat chicken at the same time. I, I heard <laughs> there's like a three one with like a Pizza Hut or something. There, there, it has like three different restaurants oh, in it. God, oh fuck, that's insane, man. Are the yeah. are the the seats that you sit at are they all toilets? <laughs> <laughs> because I can see myself shitting yeah. my brains out for the whole entire dinner. Uh, so hey, cool. hey, Matt, also, before yeah. we move on to the news or whatever, you want to give out your channel? I don't think you did that yet. Oh, uh, my channel is <laughs> You and Your Horror Movies is the uh, the channel. Yeah, just Google or YouTube that. Type that in the search bar. I'm sure it'll pop up. And yep. uh, give him a sub. Check out his videos. Yep. <laughs> I, got me icon- I got myself the icon is, fast food, uh, man. Sorry. Fast food? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, totally thinking about it. Uh 
And of course, Matt is also part of Body Bags. You know, he's yes. the Friday, Friday guy. Yep, my own spot. You for tomorrow. You know, oddly enough, my fast food rest, my favorite fast food restaurants aren't even in Canada. We don't have really? we don't have a Jack in the Box or an In and Out Burger in Canada. So, no, I've like never my, heard of In and Out. In and Out is the shit. It's so fucking good. They're all like they're only in the in the West Coast. Wow. So like I'm thinking like lots of like you know Nevada to like California. And that's pretty much all you can find them. So, so pretty much you take the food in and shit comes right out. Oh, yeah. Is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's totally awesome. But, yeah, with that said, JP, do we got some news? Yes, we have some news. Not that much this week, but a few notable things. This first little piece, I thought it was extremely important to talk about. So we're going to discuss it first just so it's at the beginning of the show so people can hear and support this. It is not horror related directly. But if you guys remember – a little old episode that we did called The Battery, where we reviewed The Battery. <laughs> Forget exactly what episode it was, but I'm sure it was like mm. 28 or something. I don't have a clue. <laughs> this this uh, guy who made The Battery, Jeremy Gardner, I believe his name was. Yeah. Um, he, he did hear that podcast. I, I mean, this, this guy I thought was so awesome with his both acting because he played one of the lead characters in the battery and directing for a film that was filmed so cheaply. It, like we gave it so much praise and I, I fully stand by that. It, it's one of my favorite viewing experiences in recent memory. I even noticed he was in a cameo, I believe in spring. Uh, he, he played yeah, the friend yeah. character at the beginning. I think he's a great actor too. So I, I hope he continues to act and actually he does. Basically, this is something new, guys. This is something interesting. I've heard it kind of sprinkled around. I've heard other movies attempt this before, kind of on a lesser, I guess, notable scale. But Jeremy Gardner has completed his next film. It's called Tex Montana Will Survive. And it's not a horror film. It does seem to have sort of a dark undertone to it. Uh, but it's a comedy. It's about – take – maybe survivor man you know the the canadian who yeah. goes out and films himself the real legit survivor guy not bear grills dude or any of those other <laughs> fools who try to fake it uh yeah. survivor man is legit as hell and he's you know one of my favorite tv personalities like i love this guy but basically takes survivor man guy named tex montana played by jeremy gardner and he's basically it's a one-man show he's doing that's the a survivor fucking man's man name thing. <laughs> Tex Montana, you yeah. can't get any more manly than yeah. that. I'm after uh, two states, baby. So, yeah. anyway, he is be- the concept behind the movie is he goes out into the wilderness and films himself, and everything just goes wrong, and he sucks at it, and it's and it's comedy ensues. So, so basically, this film is already done. It's done. It's completed. It's filmed. It's re- it's edited. It's ready to go. But Jeremy Gardner goes on to say about how they literally made, like, I think it, it showed up, like, $140 off of the battery or something. It was something crazy. Like, he, they, they pretty much didn't make any money on the battery. And he thought that even though he didn't make money, it would propel him in his film career and he would get more films and stuff like that. And he said it didn't really work like that. So basically what he's doing is this film's done. He has a Kickstarter up. It was. It's called Tex Montana Will Survive Worldwide Release. Type that into Kickstarter. Go check out the page because what he's asking for, he's not asking for money to fund the film because it's already done. What he's asking for is fifty thousand dollars. All right, it's already at eight thousand three hundred and seventy-five with twenty-eight days to go. And basically, what he wants to do is, if he gets that fifty thousand dollars, he wants to release the film in, in near immediately. Mm-hmm. Skipping the entire distribution game, releasing it to everyone, everywhere, all over the world, on the same day, all at the same time, for free, forever and ever and ever. Download it, make your own Blu-rays, make your own DVDs, share it, rip it, put it on YouTube, whatever you want to do with it. And that's his. That's the model he's trying to create. He's trying to change the distribution game. Fund the f- fund the distribution right now, fifty thousand dollars, and the film's free for everybody to see on Vudu, on YouTube, on on all these different platforms. The thing is, mm-hmm. it's it's amazing for him to to kind of do this and attempt this, and I think that everybody should support it because it's. Let's face it, like the way films are distrib- dis- 
distributed now, it, it's kind of snaky. Like the filmmakers don't make really any money. It's just yeah. It, but honestly, at the same time, like it, it makes sense because these companies can't really take risks on films that don't sell. Physical media is dying. The the renting game is so competitive. There's a lot that goes into it and goes on around it. But I just thought that this is an important step into maybe a new direction. Maybe it's not the right direction, but it's at least something new that we could attempt and try because if we don't try, we won't know if it will succeed or if it will fail and everything stays the same. So you have to attempt to try new things. Although this isn't horror, I would really appreciate if you guys would at least view the video. It's very funny. Maybe... Maybe donate. Don't even donate if you don't want to. I'm not saying you have to or anything like that. Just check it out. Check it out. What, what's? It's funny. It's five minutes long, the video. Yeah, that's cool, man. Cool. That's very, very cool. Um, yeah, it'd be cool if he had like a, you know, he, he distributes this to the world so everyone can see it for free and things like that. Uh, for the people that wanted to make like their own copy of it, it'd be cool that if he had artwork and stuff and just like well, a downloadable let artwork let me just on his tell you this. on his website, so you could download it, burn your own copy, and you got your own, got your own, uh, your hard copy media of it. Let Pretty me cool. just read you this little thing. Our goal, if our campaign is successful, we will erase the slow, staggered process typically necessary to bring a film worldwide to a worldwide audience. By releasing Text Montana digitally, YouTube, Vimeo, download, torrent, ETC, via Creative Commons license in every territory for free almost immediately. This means anyone anywhere in the world will be able to do just any, about anything they want with the movie. Examples include watch it, rewatch it, stubbornly refuse to watch it, share it, screen it, re-edit it into a better film, burn it to a DVD and Blu-ray. We'll even supply printable artwork and give that nice. to people <laughs> who don't know how to play videos on the interwebs. <laughs> so seriously, like, Moves, not everything right man. there not man it. so i'm glad you brought that up because i would have forgot to mention it but i mean i cannot help but to root for this guy he made one of my favorite films in the last like 10 years he just seems like a genuinely genuine passionate filmmaker and i will be donating something i can't donate a lot but i'll give five dollars or something and i encourage you guys to at least watch it and see what you guys think about it yeah, that's. I cool, can see man. the both. I can see both pros and cons to this, for both for this free movie. Do share. All right, for pros, of course. Hey, it's a free movie. I can donate to give whatever I want, and this movie gets made, which is awesome. But here are some of the cons. I know a lot of people who do Kickstart. They want something in return. They want yeah, you get a free movie, but that's it. I can donate a dollar, and I get a free movie. That's a good point. Or I can donate. Twenty-five dollars, thirty dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, whatever you want to. Yeah, people aren't really just willing to donate. They right. always what actually am I gonna want. Get yeah, return. they want something in return. Yeah, a lot of people are like, okay, this one movie is getting fundraised. If I donate thirty, I'll get a Blu-ray. If I donate forty, I get this signed uh, Blu-ray, a script. I get I get something else in return, which is pretty good. <clears throat> but I like this idea of what he's doing of making this movie pretty much ready available for everybody. But then I could be like, well, I won't donate. I'll wait until everybody else does it. I'm still going to watch it free now because now it's out and about for everybody. But if he gives like some other perks, like, yes, the downloadable data uh, artwork, make it like if you donate 5 to $10, you get a DVD artwork. Uh, 15 to 20 maybe a Blu-ray artwork or something extra bonus for people. Because I know people love bonuses. They love extras for their money. You know, it, it's such a tough thing, too, because he's sitting here trying to, you know, attempt something new. And at the same yeah. time, you know, like, if this is what it has to come to, it's pretty much the exact same thing as, like, this whole Kickstarter, you know, here's something for your money, <laughs> you know, type thing, right? Well, so I will it, tell you guys, it's, it's, it's uh, there one. are perks. So, it, you know, the five ten dollar $10 one is nothing. It's just, you know, thanks for your help or whatever. The $25 one, you get a shirt. The $50 one, you get a uh, contribution in the credits of the film. So I think what That's would be cool, cool is everybody, uh, let's all donate together and get 22 shots of moods and horror up in the credits for 50 bucks. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> Don't you think Maybe you can that do that cool? to the, uh, the Facebook page. Maybe uh, talk to everybody in there and say, hey, if we all pull our money together... Maybe like two bucks each or something. I mean, hell, if it really came down to it, me and Moots could probably afford twenty five each. <laughs> oh yeah, I, but, know a lot I of mean, people can, but just putting the cool whole if everybody did it. 
Yeah. You know? Uh, but, you could probably afford that. You could yeah, probably afford that. You know, and it would go towards a good cause. So if anybody's interested in maybe doing that with us, that would be cool. If not, you know, that's cool too. But also, it, starting at $100, you get the Blu-ray, DVD, stuff like that. So, I mean, there is perks. But at the same time, you know, they're trying to make the money uh, so that they can – they don't – they're not at a financial risk to giving the film away for free essentially. You know, if they get $50,000 in return – which is what they're asking for, then that movie was a success. It's out there. They made it. Yeah, and they, they made some money yeah. so they can live. So, yeah. yeah. I like I like it, man. I like it. I'm down. I, I, I'll definitely you know? do it because that sounds so much fun. I've done Kickstarters before, and this sounds fun. Yeah, I've donated to my fair shares too. So I, I like doing it though, you know. Yeah. But this is interesting. This is an interesting premise. So very cool. Yeah, big props, if, big props for, to him for you know attempting this also. And, and if anybody out there does donate, leave in the comments that you know that you heard about it through us. Maybe one day we could get an interview with Jeremy Gardner or something, which would be cool. Hmm. Yeah, I wish I hadn't lock, lost my contacts with the the guy that knew him that I met at Horcon yeah. last year. <laughs> well, I, I have heard him do interviews before, so I mean, I'm sure he would. I haven't reached out to him or anything, but yeah. You know, it never hurts to see our name floating around before we reach out to him. I know. I, I mean, he even contacted Astron Six, the guys from Astron Six, and actually got back to him that night. He was like showing me the the text messages. And I'm like, shit, man, this guy's actually actually knows these guys. Crazy. Yeah. I'm like, but so that is you know that part of the news. Uh, I thought that it was very important to kind of talk about. But moving on. Um, Amityville Awakening. Now this is the film that we were just talking about the Amityville series pre-game and i mean this film has seriously been delayed for like two years now i think it's been filmed for like two years or you're close to that it's uh, an official sequel in the amityville horror franchise through the weinstein company slash dimension i don't remember the original release date but it was probably at least early 2015 if not earlier than that and now the the release date is now April 1st, 2016. The, the only thing that is interesting about this film to me is it was directed by P2 and Maniac Remakes uh, director, which I can't yeah, pronounce yeah. his name, so I'm not going to attempt it. But, you know, I, I, that makes me curious. But n- whenever a film gets pushed back that many times, Jesus Christ, it can't be a good sign. Yeah, I mean, it is an Amityville film, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean that probably says it all right there. Oh, God. I mean, are they ever gonna stop with these or just like Nah. They're the name, it's the name. Everybody knows Amityville, the Amityville, New York, Amityville Horror. And Fucking, the, and this film is the house. You know, is linked to the original franchise, right? Allegedly. Again, you know, allegedly. Yeah. You know, I, I still think I brought it up many times on the podcast, but I still think it's truly amazing that they never came out with a you know an official sequel to the remake but they've came out with four or five sequels to the original franchise since they dropped that remake i don't even think there's a direct sequel to the original that exists (laughs) they're all like spinoffs well i mean i guess the second film is like the prequel to the first which isn't a sequel (laughs) yeah so i mean but it is linked though we can use the word linked the second film is definitely a better film. I want to see a remake of that. If you're going to do any of them, remake the the, the prequel. Because that's a the damn pre- good oh. story. Yeah, no, it is good. Yeah. 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 So anyway, after that, we have Fox apparently has ordered an Exorcist pilot. So there's not a remake. It's the now TV. But I want to just say something about The Exorcist. The Exorcist is such a very specific film. Everything about it is very specific and unique. There's a thousand exorcism movies and nothing is like The Exorcist because it did it first and it did it best. So I don't even know how you do an exorcist TV show. It's just going to be a TV show about exorcisms. It's not going to be The Exorcist. It's not going to have anything to do with The Exorcist. Oh, that sounds like the worst idea. It's like it's just multiple episodes of you know people getting exercised. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here's Father Barry, and uh, he's going to exercise uh, Lynn here today. And uh, yeah, you know, like okay. 
It I'm doesn't... Geraldo Rivera, and today yeah. on the top show, we're going <laughs> to exercise this demon from this little whore over Re- here. <laughs> reporting live is Geraldo <laughs> Rivera. <laughs> Dear That's God. Funny. It's so it's weird to me, man, because it's just not it's not it's not something you can really do. You just can't do the exorcist again, even if you do like you can't do it in long form like a TV show. It's just going to be a different show. It's going to be an in name only. It's, it's not going to be the exorcist unless they take a story like the original exorcist, you know, like how there kind of is a backstory and they they, they just expand it. I don't know. I, I don't really know. I I really hope that they don't do the, you know, specific episodes like almost like an anthology type you know, unrelated episodes of just exorcisms. <laughs> I'm I terrible. Know, That's ter- I'm just stupid. That just sounds terrible. But I can see them just doing like a, you know, just a total expansion of one story. You know, make it into like a ten episode series, and you know, basically expanding the original Exorcist movie into ten episodes, but not that actual story. Maybe doing something else with it, which still isn't really going to be original because I mean, let's face it. Like you said before. Half of the Exorcist movies that come out today are very similar in, you know, in story. They're pretty much all the exact same. Mm-hmm. There's never really anything in these films. I mean, I shouldn't I shouldn't say that about all of them. There is the odd one that has something kind of new mixed in there. But they're all relatively the same film with relatively the same fucking name. You know the what? The Exorcism of Emily Rose. The Exorcism of fucking Billy Joe. I'm just making shit up now. But yeah. you know, you get the point, right? right? But those movies. The Last relatively... Exorcism Part 2. <laughs> yeah, which has to be the stupidest fucking title ever yeah. for a film. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But a lot of these films aren't bringing anything new to the game. And I mean, you could, you know, in contrast that, it could be like, well, either a slasher films. Yeah, but you know what? Slasher films are better. So fuck off. <laughs> yeah, you know, there was one exorcism film that I was interested in that got announced. It was called Crooked Lake, and it was going to be done by Adam Green. It was going to be the first time that he took somebody else's script and made a movie out of it. He did a little rewrite of his own. Anyway, like, I guess the production, pre production went horribly wrong. The company did all kind of shady shit, according to him, and basically he pulled out of the project. So, you know, right away, that. <laughs> That was like the one exorcism film I was interested in. And uh, yeah, it's just, I, it's like Jaws, dude. You're not going to do it better. Leave it alone. <laughs> Matt's just, you can say something, man. Come on. <laughs> Come on. There, there, there are some good shark movies out there that are that better are not to Jaws. watch. <laughs> I should but, I, I, I like shark. some the shark movies, dude. They're, they're, the, it's, it's, you know, I like the, it. deep blue sea and stuff. I think the word no, just, better oh, is sorry, just kind ahead. of the word better is like kind of misused when it comes to shark movies and stuff. Yeah, Jaws is probably the best shark film ever made in quality in terms of you know good filmmaking. Is it the, right? the, film, the, the film is good. Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> but in my opinion, there's funner films to watch than Jaws based on shark films, like especially the Italian ripoffs. They are such oh, a blast. God. We watch Some Cruel Jaws. Cruel Jaws, <laughs> The Last Shark. Those films are so much fun to watch. No, they are not better in quality than Jaws at all. Is the acting better? Fuck no. Is the effects better? Probably not. Did like eight people die in the making of them? Probably. <laughs> but, Did you get back to? You know, it is what it is, man. Like yeah. it, it's just you know what I'm saying. Like Jaws is the staple of shark films, but yeah, in terms of actual fun films. I think there's, I think there's, there's an argument there. So. But there's not a lot of fun exorcism movies out there. <laughs> yes, the exorcist movie is your staple. That's where everything goes. It's spawned. Could you but... imagine that quote on the new one? It's like the exorcism of Charlie Murphy. Char- <laughs> I just said Charlie Murphy. Really? Charlie Murphy. The Charlie Murphy. Of Charlie Murphy. Of Charlie Murphy. And, Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre Two. We, 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 gotta... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we get a screener. So we. <laughs> So they want a quote from us. It's like 22 shots of moods and horse says this movie is absolutely so much fun. <laughs> we just would, got me we might as well I, just bury ourselves right there, man. You there was the one exorcism fun. movie that actually is fun. What's that? Repossessed. Oh, shit. The comedy? The, the comedy one. It's got Linda Blair in it playing <laughs> the right. same role. Yeah. But you got Leslie Nielsen playing the priest. That's right. And it is an exorcism movie. That is true. I haven't seen that in years, man. I don't even own a copy of that, man. I picked it up the other day. I'm like, oh, I, I put it in my comedy section right now, but I think I might move, remove it there. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but 
<laughs> like I got thinking when you guys were talking about the exorcism being a TV show and yeah. all these different exorcism movies. I'm thinking, is there any other movie that really that people are exorcised and could be considered an exorcism type movie? It got me thinking to like the insidious line, like part two where the, the husband pretty much gets the demon in him, but it has to do with, you know, uh, sleeping and being out of your body, total body experience. So there's that way, but it's not a demon. I don't think that would be considered a exorcism type movie. Mm. It's something mm. different, but anything. Exorcism of Emily Rose, same thing. Mm-hmm. Exorcism of Billy Bob Thornton, same thing. I don't know. Just throw another name out there. Yeah, definitely. The biggest, the, the, one of the biggest problems with those type of films is that they keep throwing that stupid claim, disclaimer on there. It's like, you know, based on real events and this is based on true story. And I'm like, no, it's not. Stop fucking using it. They should actually, there should be a law of putting that on there. <laughs> you shouldn't be allowed to just keep using that shit on fucking movies. It drives me nuts. Yeah. So, uh, moving on, guys. We have American Horror Story Season 6. This is some anti-news. This is some non-news. This is some, like, covering up some false news. Apparently, some sites reported that the Season 6 is going... Because each one, you know, it's the first one was about a house and a family. The second one was about an asylum. Third one was about a witch's coven. Fourth one was about freak shows. Fifth one was set in a hotel. I love what the idea... I still haven't checked out the show. Yeah, yeah, I know. Blah, blah, blah. I should check it out. Everybody tells me. But apparently the sixth season was announced as something different. It was going to follow the Slenderman myth. This is n- untrue from what I'm hearing. Uh, I Slen- heard a different story. Slenderman? What is the myth it, it, about me? It's like, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, man? I'm slender. Uh, yeah, there's there's like sort of a, I guess it was a creepy pasta story that yeah. kind of went huge and there was games made out of it and stuff. But apparently. Creepy pasta? You're really behind on the times. I've, I think I think I know what it is. I, I just need to refresh. It, it on it's like page. just like a Wikipedia esque site where oh, it's just like a bunch of yeah. short stories, like user submitted. A lot of them are actually very creepy. Um, there was one That's that was written about a lost episode of Ed, Ed and Eddie, where like some crazy shit happened. It was only aired one time. There, there's just like all kind of creepy ass stories on there. But uh, I don't really read that often, so I don't really do that that much. But apparently, like Slender Man was one of the biggest and. Apparently, people were reporting that American Horror Story Season 6 was going to feature a Slenderman-esque story, but apparently that is not true. So just I heard something that. different, too. That was a letdown. <laughs> they were going to do a, um American Horror Story um, summer camp, I heard. Oh, be that doing. would be the greatest. Greatest one ever. I'll fucking that would skip be right to it and watch it. Yeah, sla- <laughs> a slasher. Do a sla- summer camp slasher. And a- yes, I'm down. But again, that's all speculation. They're, they're they're throwing all this stuff out. Yeah, it just makes no sense. sense. Makes no sense, sense to me. What what took so long to to fucking six seasons to do that? That should have been the first season. Moods, we really got to get on this show soon. We need to turn it into like a podcast or something because they, like <laughs> that's the only way we're ever gonna check these out. But uh, like they sound so interesting to me. I've heard time and time again that this is the best horror on TV. It drives me crazy that I still haven't – they're on season six fucking years and I still haven't watched a single episode. Which is saying a lot though too because you know in today's uh, TV airwaves, there is a horror show on every network. Yeah. There's yeah, like a million shows. Bigger. It's so crazy. Like you know, of course this week on our Top 10 Tuesday series was Top 10 – TV horror shows of all time and you know people just kept leaving comments like what about this one and that one and it was like all these new shows right yeah, I'm like insane, yeah. sorry man I'm a little retro <laughs> when it comes to TV <laughs> theme shows and I did yeah, say that yeah what was like the, the most modern on there mm-hmm. fucking Dexter probably Dexter yeah 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 which some people still argue if it's horror or not uh, I always it's consider- dark it's serial killer come on it's a serial killer that's the thing yeah. and that's why I lumped it in there and stuff and you know and people were like, oh, what about Halston and stuff? I'm like, well, Halston's more of a straight-up comedy than with, with horror, horror references. references. Yeah, it's, it it's is. really a comedy. It's not a horror at all, but, I mean, no. it's it's definitely, like, genre. Yeah. But anyway. And I threw The Walking Dead way further up on the list. I know a lot of people were like, well, why don't you put Walking Dead on the near the bottom? Walking Dead is the best. I'm like, oh, I got that. When it started coming out, it was great. <laughs> now it's starting to get a little, meh. I got that, too, and everyone's like, no Walking Dead, and I was like, "Well, if you stuck around, I scrolled the end of the video, down." I, that was I, the first comment I seen. 
I, I, I was like, well, I've stuck around to the end of video. And I said, I don't blame me. A lot of people cut off the video when they, mm-hmm. when I see number one, but I'm talking for like three minutes after. And I explained why. I did. I cut it know? off. And, but that's the thing. And, it, you know, and I, I get so many questions on my videos because they, people don't watch to the end. And I explain everything at the end of the video. <laughs> I, actually, the homie Paul Henderson asked me today what the new song I use in my videos are. And if he would have waited till the end, he would have seen that I credit See? it every time. See, now you know where I'm coming from because <laughs> I feel like I'm answering. I'm just like, okay, here's, uh, you know, click to this part in the video, 13 minutes. <laughs> It'll answer your question. So. That song is called <laughs> Gore Hound by Harley Poe, by the way. But I anyway. was kind of, I, I was kind of surprised that no one commented about Todd in the Book of Pure Evil because I, I made a comment about, you know, this was the show before Deathgasm. Yeah. It's it totally is. true. It's totally true. I never even thought about that until I said that in my video. And after I was like, huh. Hmm. Totally true. Shit. True, Us Canadians true. are so damn smart. So <laughs> <laughs> m- moving on here in the news, guys, we have an announcement for a sequel to what we do in the shadows, which I'm fucking totally down for. Uh, that's cool, man. And yeah. it is called I dig this title. We're wolves. As <laughs> we are wolves. <laughs> We're wolves. <laughs> it's great, right? That is great. It is. It's, it's clever. Uh, I still haven't uh, seen it. Oh, it's so good. I I heard so many good things about it. It's actually pretty funny, I've heard. I can't oh, remember my so exact well list, but I would say it's my favorite horror comedy is in terms of like a pure horror comedy of the of two thousand fifteen. So good. the thing that one of the things I love about that movie was the effects used in it because it's shot documentary style and the effects are so good. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it Dude, really that sticks Nosferatu out. Vampire look, vampire look great. Dude, I, I had to pause the film when I can't remember what his name was, like the Nosferatu, and they're like, "Hey, they're like, where is Nosferatu?" And they're like, "He's not coming to the meeting. He's eight thousand years old." <laughs> I like, just lost it on that part, man. <laughs> he can't fucking move, man. It's so funny the way he says it. Flight of the Concords comedy, man. Really, it's kind of funny. Just a little. Matt, get up on it. It's good. It's good. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> just, just my Amazon wish list. <laughs> nice. Just a little update here. Uh, we were talking about it pregame and Leatherface. They released a still, which I'm not big for stills because I feel like I don't watch trailers. I don't really look at stills either. But I was just curious to see the look of the film because we seen a poster and that was it. Well, now mm. we see the first still and it is a picture of the actor Stephen Dorff. And he is leaning up against a police car with another policeman looks like a sheriff and a deputy maybe but the thing of note is that this police car is very old looking probably like 60s so um you know that once again goes to the fact that this is a prequel to the original 74 version so it's probably going to be like a period piece which i think is pretty cool you know so uh that's that's a little update no word on when it's coming out yet no Mm. no announcement for the Mm. You know, release date or anything, but something of note is the the homette Angela Bettis, yeah, Angie Bettis, mm. who, who I've become a big fan of recently, has uh you know she's um she's playing Mama Sawyer, which I think is a, probably going to be some great casting. Uh, I think oh, Angela yeah. Bettis is super underrated. I recently watched the Carrie remake, the first the mm. first remake. And uh, she played Carrie at 29 years old. No sissy <clears throat> spacek, but definitely tip tip your cap to Angela Bettis in in the remake of Carrie. She did a decent job. Yeah, me and the homies were talking about you know her performance in May the other day, and you know I've said it before, and I, I still I still hold by what I said, and I've said that it's in my opinion it's one of the best performances in a horror film of all time. It's so fucking believable and disturbing. It's just she's so good. Yeah, that's on my so short list. It. That's on my short list. I have the DVD just waiting to pop it in. Like, it's just, it's one of those things you just got to see, man. You've seen a movie before, right, Matt? Wait, May? which one movie? May. May. No, I have not. Oh, damn. I've heard some things about it, but I have not seen May. It's, uh, it's really good. Her performance is something else, but yeah, she, I can totally, I can just picture her as Mama Soy right now. Because she's really good at playing like a freak, <clears throat> so nice. it's gonna be awesome. So you're not 100 percent sure if it takes place in the 60s or 50s. When I think of the 60s, I think of like hippie Leatherface, and I think of the 50s, I think of Leatherface behind some white picket fence. <laughs> I don't know why. 
<laughs> That's just the way I picture it. But yeah. All right. So moving on. Um, last week I mentioned to you guys that <laughs> fucking Friday the Thirteenth. You know, the shit happened with it. David Bruckner got pulled from it. Nick and Tosca got pulled from it, who was the Hannibal writer. He wrote some Hannibal stuff, the TV show. And he was the writer on the new Friday the 13th. And, you know, more information has now come out about the, you know, once considered version of the film. And at first he goes on to say that, you know, it was found footage at first. They did a rewrite after they scrapped that idea. And he's, you know, says that he was wanted it to be really cool, like coming of age, like really badass eighties characters set in the eighties. And he basically said that the film was actually going to open up with the old eighties Paramount logo as well. And it just the more he's talk, the more we're finding out about this, the more I'm like kind of getting bummed that we didn't see this version, and we have to wait to see probably a version that's going to be lesser. Yeah, well, it makes you not want to report on it anymore. Yeah, I keep saying I'm not, but I just can't, I just can't not do it, and I need to not do it. Damn that would it. be cool though, man. The original Paramount, get that old feel back. Who knows. Uh, there was another little piece of news here that I, I didn't actually write down, but I just remembered it. And this is the <clears throat> apparently the movie Moose Jaws, which uh, <laughs> this is Kevin Smith's like next movie. He did, he just finished Yoga Hoosers, which is like – I don't even know what it is. It stars his daughter though. And his next one he's going to do, it's the Great North Trilogy or whatever – you know the three films set in Canada. The first one was Tusk. The second one is Yoga Hosers, and the fourth, the third one is Moose Jaws, which is you know Jaws but with a moose. <laughs> and uh, That's awesome. basically, I guess what he said, I, I, I hear that he hinted at Justin Long's Walrus having a cameo or being in the film or something in Moose Jaws. So ah, Moose Jaws so versus good. Walrus Man. That's yeah. so good. <laughs> So, I love it. Yeah, there's that. And uh, guys, I think that actually wraps up the news. There is one announcement that I'll just throw out here. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, but Synapse mm-hmm. Films mm-hmm. announced the first of the couple Argento films they're going to release on Blu-ray, and that is Tenebre. So uh, that is coming out. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit more of that later in the show. Stay tuned, right? For that. Stay tuned. So, if you don't want to hear this part, hit those show notes and skip forward to that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. So, moving into mood swings here, the DVD, Blu, and DVD and Blu-ray releases for February second, two thousand sixteen. And uh, yeah, starting out here, we've got uh, the Blu-ray release of From Dust Till Dawn. Speaking of TV horror-related TV uh, shows on El Rey. Um, still haven't seen it, man. You know, I keep hearing good things. I don't know what season two is like. Has anyone heard anything good about season two? Heard good I things. I happily about... watched part season one. I still have to finish season one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I haven't really heard anything about season two, but I did hear good things about season one, so that's cool. But that's coming out on Blu-ray. Uh, next up here, we got this like ridiculous edition of the giant spider invasion coming out here. Um, which I already thought this was out. Is it not out yeah. already? It's out. I have it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so the same February site. I got to see what's different about it. Um, Why this version's coming out. Do you have uh, the 3DS version? Yes. Interesting, because it does have the the date on Amazon as February 2nd. But if you're not familiar with it, yeah, the the spider, the giant spider invasion is a 3DS version coming out from VCI. That's ridiculous. How does a movie like this get 3 discs? I think this, the third disc is a, is a uh, soundtrack. Okay. Because there was actually a – they did a play of the giant spider invasion. And it's got music from the play that they did. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I would love I would love the so – they, they, they made a play of it. Yeah. <laughs> like a Broadway play or something stupid. That's but, fucking great. If they did write – I think if they put in the uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 version mm-hmm. on this – disc that would be perfect yeah totally right that'd be that'd be super cool yeah that'd be awesome yeah because they recently just did that with uh the brain that wouldn't die the screen factory episode 
or the oh, screen pack on there. It's got the uh, yeah, it's got the episode on there. So yeah, I nice. thought that was a super cool move by Screen Factory to do that. By the way, yeah, that's that's a really nice touch. That's a cool feature. So, um, yeah, moving along here, we've got uh, Hellions coming out from IFC Midnight, which is being released by Screen Factory. I think it's yeah. dropping this one. So. You know, I've heard, you know, this one I thought had some of the coolest imagery just based on like the stills that were released and I've heard pretty much nothing but bad things. So that's very, I, I keep hearing the same thing about the movie that it starts out really good and then it just loses steam. The third act sucks. Hmm. That sucks, man, because, you know, if you have such a good build up, like there's nothing worse than having a bad third act for a film. But I don't know, man, I'm going to keep my hopes up because I know it's a Canadian film. So I got to I got to give him a little bit of hope. Yeah. You know, so. Give them that support. Plus, it's uh, it's a Halloween themed film, so <laughs> gotta check it out. Yeah, man. coming out in February. Coming out in February. <laughs> yeah, they fucked the dog on that one. Well, what? Remember when Screen Factory released New Year's Evil in February? <laughs> oh wow, that's probably like a year ago when we recorded that. <laughs> Shit, dude, that was fucking funny. Um, yeah, moving along here, uh, we got one here from uh, Kino, and it's Highway to Hell from 1991. I'm on no, a <laughs> Yeah, this one is not the – I think the Highway to Hell film. I think there's another one called, right? Highway to Hell. There's one called Hell. Hell's Highway. Oh, Hell is Highway. Which okay, I like. That, that's the shot on video one. I believe 2002 release date maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one right here has got uh, Patrick uh, Bergeron and Kirstie Swanson in this film from 1991. When I think I've was... seen this one. It was actually pretty corny. Yeah, I've, I know I've seen this film. I just can't remember yeah. it. I can't remember the film, so – um, <laughs> this one right here, I am going to, I am going to announce it cause it just, it kind of cracked me up, but it's called the last witch hunter and it's starring Vin Diesel. I don't know if this is, like, I actually seen previous to this on TV released by Lions, the theater. It's being released by Lions. Really? Yeah. Yep, this was in the theater. Oh wow. Lionsgate's released in this one. It's got a, it decent- looked exactly what you would expect. Sort of that over stylized, like CG heavy type film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was looking at the rating on here. It says PG-13. Wow. That's not inviting. No. At all. PG-13 film with Vin Diesel and Elijah Wood. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'd I like I, me some Elijah Wood, though. Gotta be I can't believe that was in the theater. Actually, I can. Vin Diesel, he sells tickets, right? Um, <laughs> sells moving a lot along. of tickets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Moving along here, we got one from Anchor Bay, and they were, you know... Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't even know what to say about this one. I'm sure JP will talk about it later in the show, but the Martyrs remake is being yeah, released Yeah, stay here. tuned for that. Uh, we'll be talking about it. DVD and Blu-ray, I believe, both. Yeah, remake of Martyrs. Um, still shaking my head, but it is what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We can't complain too, too much. There wasn't a lot of remakes last year, but this year's already starting with some, so it's like, uh... Uh, again, from uh, Shout Factory, Scream Factory line, we've got Zombie Fight Club. This is a contemporary, probably Zomcom, I'm assuming. Asian style. It looks Asian. I don't even know if it is, though. Uh, I'm not. Like, I wish this wasn't even coming out right now. Like, they need to chill the F out with all these damn contemporary things, <laughs> 10 releases in a month and stuff. Yeah, like, this is just, whew, I don't know, man. Watch this! Just, this thing's gonna turn out to be great. It's not even gonna be a zomcom. It's gonna be super uh-huh. serious and, and totally good. Man. It's gonna be an alien outpost. That's probably what's gonna be. Oh god! Don't even <laughs> get started on alien outpost, man. That was terrible. <sighs> uh, we got one here from Image Entertainment. It's a zombie double feature featuring State of Emergency and Infected. Have we seen uh, either of those films? State of Emergency, I believe I have seen actually. Yeah, it's like and, two years old. Yeah, I, I think that I saw, one too. Yeah wasn't I, good i think it was bad yeah so infected i mean that's got to be the most generic title for a film ever i think there's a hundred of those so i have no idea which film that is oh what um, do you know a guy in a gas mask <laughs> <laughs> exactly right and we got another one here from image of course image is releasing all hallows eve 2 which i was supposed to actually get a screener of and i don't know what happened to that so i probably so- won't be covering that one probably a good thing honestly so please tell me what is going on with all these Halloween related films being released in February. Well, I think that that film <laughs> had a VOD. Of <laughs> that film probably had a VOD in October. I think so. Yeah, I guess so. You think it would try to pump these things out just as around that time? Mm-hmm. You know, I I don't know. Yeah, it's just me. Oh, oh, here we go. Yes, I'm so excited. From four digital media, we've got the haunting of Ellie Rose. Bonafide go. 
are we not just talking about this? You know, if it's not uh, the exorcism of uh, Charlie Murphy, you know, it's a haunting Ellie Rose. What the f- yeah. this cover? Is Ellie so- Rose, come on, come on, Emily Rose, Ellie Rose, what are you doing? I, I was gonna comment on that too. That's way oh, too I close. I saw a trailer for that movie. It looks awful. It probably is. Oh, that's the one with a she turns eighteen, and that's when the demons come after her. Oh, no, don't watch it, people. Haunting of Ellie. Okay, the truth is far worse than her <sighs> twisted nightmares. <laughs> man that's just somebody's ugh. mother wrote that tagline it's just it's <laughs> not, it's just not good um this one me and matt were talking about pregame and i'm you know at first i was very kind of confused on this i'm still a little confused on how they did this but i think we may come to a conclusion but uh from synodyme this one is called extraordinary tales now the interesting thing about this release is the cast of it it is starring sir christopher lee Bella Gosi, Julian Sands, Roger Corman, and Gilmero del Toro. It is <laughs> this a short film compilation? This is a well, what I after doing a little bit of research, it is an animated anthology film um, dealing with uh, Poe stories. Hmm. So basically, they took five Edgar Allan Poe stories, brought them to vivid life in this heart pounding animated anthology featuring you know blah blah blah. Um, so I'm assuming that they maybe took some audio from previous films or maybe unused stuff from Bella Gosi and Christopher Lee. Yeah, I was about to say, did, did they story hop around... the DeLorean for this one or what? That's what I'm saying. They probably took some things and then kind of incorporated what they said in the audio into yeah. their story. Because you could totally make a story around what they say okay. and it would seem legit. So this is kind of interesting, but it's animated. Now, I'm really curious on it. Yeah, well, the last time I heard of something like this, it turned out terrible. That was uh, Night of the Living Dead reanimated. Oh, you know what? I've had that in my collection for so long. Still haven't watched I it. I watched a few <laughs> clips and it's just awful. You know what's yeah. funny? I've I've seen a couple of p- people talk about that in videos and say and said pretty much how much they loved it. Yeah, it's really interesting. So yeah, maybe, maybe. I, like I said, I didn't see the whole thing, so could be judging before I watched the whole thing. I guess. I mean, you're, you you okay. do that. You do that quite a bit. Yep. No, I was <laughs> joking. It's like it's not a trauma title, man. Come on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now this one right here got, kind of got my uh, piqued my interest a little bit. It's released by Vertical. I don't know if that's a real studio, but um, I'm not even sure if it's fully. A, no, maybe it is a horror film. But it's called He Never Died, and it's starring Henry Rollins. That's oh, fucking that looks cool. Good. Henry Rollins is batshit awesome. I like. I, I wish this guy would do more films and just more things in general. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it maybe is a. What is it? Says. Look- Sorry. No, no, you have to say sorry. Jack is an is is in a rut. His existence has been whittled down to nothing. Uh, yeah, when he finds his his long lost daughter has been taken to the city's crime syndicate, he must combat his inner demons as he goes on a bloody warpath to seek revenge. Oh, so it's a revenge film. You know what? It doesn't look doesn't appealing die. to me, honestly. <laughs> it's just it's just the fact that it has Henry Rollins in it, man. That's cool. Hmm. And it looks like they do a, a little bit like a Cain and Abel type thing. That's what got my attention. Oh, okay. That's that's cool, man. So I see Henry Rollins took a break from his motivational speaking to to do <laughs> a revenge film. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's great, man. Ah, oh, shit, man. Oh, moving along with the great sounding titles. We got one from here uh, from Arkstone, and it's called Julia. It just I love the tagline: "Revenge cuts deep," and it's this white cover with this kind of a uh, really nasty looking girl on holding a knife, like kind of psycho style. Yeah. You know, Perfect. honestly, it does. It's not the worst cover to me. No, it, it blends. Nice. It's like black and white with like, you it know, got the a red. positive it's... quote from uh, bloody disgusting. Wow. Crazy. I wish we could get some screen, you know, pre game so we could, you know, get some quotes on this. That's pretty that. much. That's probably like one of my number one goals on my bucket list is to get a quote one day. And I love when people, have or get quotes on things and they don't even know that they had a quote on something yeah like i think that's so funny when that happens it's like holy uh. shit man what the fuck <laughs> like um yeah we got one here from sony pictures and uh season one of the lizzie borden chronicles uh starring christina ricci um i don't really know much about this i mean it doesn't surprise me that they you know they turned the lizzie borden story into a tv show because there's what like a hundred movies, and didn't, didn't Christina Ricci actually play Lizzie yeah, Borden? Yeah, I think a film? couple times, maybe. So she just can't let this character go away. Well, it's not really yeah, a character. It was probably made for like the Lifetime Channel or something. Honestly, <laughs> oh, it's, it's a fucking TV show. Yeah, it's season one. Huh. 
did Proxy Hallmark. Support. That's what I'm saying. Like she did these TV, or she did a film or TV film or, or whatever it was, and then they converted that into a TV show. Maybe that was like a pilot or something. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, next up, man, oh, I was I was kind of excited when I looked at this, and then I saw who distributed it, and I was like, ah, oh, shit. This one is coming out from the Asylum, and it's called Night of the Wild. Yes. By the way, that was uh, Lifetime, by the way. Oh, what? really? Yeah. <laughs> of course it was Lifetime. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, now this looks like a you know a killer dog film, but released by the Asylum. From the writer are, of The Hitcher? Which one? I know. I was, I was worrying the same thing, actually, about that. And this was aired on the Sci-Fi channel, too. On Sci-Fi, yeah. So I can just imagine the dog probably looks like the CGI dog uh, from Rock. Well, honestly, Wilder. the cover looks pretty cool to me. Yeah, it does. Now, I know you guys don't watch trailers, but I do, and I love watching trailers. They use real dogs. Nice. Oh, do they? Yes. Wow. Okay. Now, the CGI was the comet hitting Earth. There's like a lot of dogs just standing there running around and getting people. Wait, you've seen this movie? <laughs> I watched the trailer. The trailer. <laughs> well, last time I checked, though, like, you know, doing a practical effect of a comet hitting the Earth is... You know, it, it seems a little expensive for a movie like this. <laughs> asylum, you can't get so this sounds like, uh, guys, we might break the bank on this uh, comet bit. So, um, hey, uh, hey, Jordan, you want to do one on on your computer there? Everybody's eating ramen. <laughs> yeah. So they whip one up on the on the computer. They're like, yeah, that'll work. But that's actually really cool that they use real dogs. That's very inviting. I love me some killer dog films, man. Same here. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and finally here for the releases, we've got one from Image again. Wow, this week's Wild Eye is Image, isn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Are you kidding me? Not one release from Wild Eye this week? Holy crap. That has to be a fucking, that, that's a, that's unreal. That's just unreal. And this one's called Uncaged. Uh, it's got Ben Getz in it. Interesting. And I'm assuming this is a werewolf film? You would assume correct. Beware the beast within. I think that tagline's been used. I, I was you know, thinking at least that it was like times. a prequel to the beast within or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Ah, uh, shit. Well, so that is going to... What do you think uh, about that cover? Uh, the cover's terrible. I hate yeah. that cover. Well, I'll There's be talking about that one later out. in the show as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't like There's... the cover, but... There's another movie coming out on February 2nd. Oh, you got some more? Cool. Yep. It's called The Piper. It's put out by CJ Entertainment. It's is an it, Asian oh, horror thought, film. Oh, nice. I thought maybe it was like a documentary on Roddy Piper or something. No. Uh, a little brief description. A gruesome retelling of the legendary Brothers Grimm classic. Oh. After a Korean War, a flute-playing wanderer and his son arrive to a peaceful and remote village where he makes a deal to the chief to eradicate the uncontrolled rat infestation. Using his mystical flute, he wipes the rats away from the village only to be paid with greed, corruption, and betrayal while losing the own, while losing ones he loves. Vowing for revenge, he soon changes his tune and uses his mystical flute to settle a score that will clean the land of filth once and for all. That sounds awful to me. <laughs> the cover looks awful. It looks like he's wearing a clown nose. But he's got a, like this rat on his <laughs> shoulder. <clears throat> <clears throat> wow. I'll probably pick it up. Wow. Uh, you know, actually, I was lying. I actually do have one more. <laughs> this one I read here is being released by E1, our favorite company, E1, and it's called Half Human. And, like, the cover art on this is just <laughs> – I don't even know how to take it. It's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> but it's bad at the same time. It's – I don't know. It's Half Human. Maybe it's some type of cannibal. I don't know what this is. Man was not created alone. Hmm. Oh, that's pretty funny. He was created with an animal. So. Oh God! <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So that's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> uh, now for my release of the week. Have fun with this. I know, right? This is just whoa. You know, I I, I actually checked out the releases before I came on today, and I was thinking to myself, what am I going to pick for release of the week? Um. Because I, I have to admit, man, this has to be the oddest week. I mean, generally, there's always a pretty decent Screen Factory release or, you know, there's no Wild Eyes this week. It's just a, it's a weird week. It's just kind of strange. Um, whew, 
I am going to have to go with, if you have to pick up one release this week, got to go with the classic Giant Spider Invasion 3-disc edition from VCI. That is ridiculous. And you know why? Because this it's pretty cheap. I mean, you can get the Blu-ray set for like, you know, on Amazon.com for $17.99, which is pretty good for a three disc. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. That, that's kind of the probably the one that I would have went with too, just based on the edition. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a monster flick from, well, the 50s, right? I, I can't remember exactly what year it came out, but it's a fun film. I know Matt's seen it before. He owns it. So All right. how was the edition? How was the edition? Good. It's actually really good. They did a good job with it. And, uh, yeah, the CD is all the music, which is kind of funny. <laughs> and they actually talk about a lot of it in the back. A lot of special features to it, too, which I was kind of shocked. Maybe this is like a re-release. I don't know why, because maybe just the dates are wrong in this, but I could have sworn this came out before. But uh, anyways. Unless they did a pre-sale. I don't remember. They could have. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure, but, yeah. So the giant spider invasion. Check it out, three disc for your viewing pleasure. Yeah. All right. Moving along into voicemails and questions, and I believe we do have some voicemails and we got some questions, so let's dig right into this, JP. Yeah, so we do have some voicemails. First up, we're going to have Rob with the two-parter because he does get cut off. Uh, the homie Rob from Georgia, and uh, he asks us a couple questions. All right, Rob from Georgia, hey, you're guys, up next. Rob from Georgia calling. Uh, just a few things on my mind, I guess. Uh, first of all, real quick, uh, I agree with your moods on aliens being uh, overrated. Uh, yeah, yeah. For me, mostly it's length. <laughs> I don't know why, but that movie is long. And I love long movies, but that, there's just something weird about that, the length of that movie. Um, but I agree, that is, uh, when compared to the original, for sure, even the third part. Uh, the theat- not the theatrical, but the extended director's cut of Alien 3, um, I actually find more enjoyable. I'm not sure why, but, uh, anyways, uh, this week, um, a little nostalgic, uh, was, uh, been watching Anthropophagus. Of course, I don't own it, but, uh, I managed to get myself, uh, hands on a, at least a copy that I could watch. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that George Eastman, the guy that played the Anthropophagus, um, I didn't realize that he was the um, Irving Wallace character, at least the masked version of Irving Wallace in Stage Fright. And I didn't even realize he wrote the script for Stage Fright. And so, I mean, like, I got all this stuff, like, just popping out at me. I didn't realize the connection uh, that uh, these movies had with George Eastman. I mean, it just kind of blew me away. Not sure if you guys had already known that, but uh, it really did kind of blow me away, just the fact that he played... Uh, the main uh, killer guy in both of those uh, films. But anyways, uh, quick question, thinking about remakes. Uh, just uh, revisited the new Poltergeist remake and, uh, uh, you know, watched that again. I'm not you know, the biggest fan of that, but it's all right. But got me to thinking. Um, so here's a little question, I guess. If you, could, if you could take your favorite director, anyone, and commission them to uh, remake any movie you want, what would it be? I'm just curious. I think I think I have my own. Uh, if I could do anything, I think I would ask Rob Zombie to direct a remake or a readaption, whatever, of um, Anthropophagus. Uh, I love Island Terror. We don't get enough of it. And I just, I don't know. I think he could do something pretty crazy. Now, I, I think that would be a good movie shot in 16 millimeter as well. And I don't know. I just think Rob Zombie could bring something pretty crazy uh, to that movie. And plus, you know, he's always looking... Uh, to uh, dig a little deeper in movies that seem to have uh, not too thick of a story. Uh, I know that's what he said about the original Halloween, and that's what you know really got him going for uh, to do the remake of Halloween was to add, add the layer of depth uh, to the story. And there's you know stuff that he could do, I think, with Anthropophagus. But uh, I don't know. That got me to thinking. I wonder what he could do with that. And it's uh, that, that would be really cool, actually. I'm not huge on remakes, but I don't know why. Maybe haven't just re watched that recently and of course with 31 coming around the corner eventually that's what that's what rob gets cut off so uh we'll just play a second part here real quick uh nothing like being cut off in mid sentence anyhow that was about it just uh curious what you would do or what what you would do uh who would be your director what would be the film and uh, why i guess why mm. why would you go or why would you want to see that and uh and just try to think too. Now that I got a little extra time here, you know who would play the Anthropophagus? Um, I can't really think of anyone except maybe the guy who plays Tiny on *Constant Out of Corpses*. 
<laughs> that might be a problem. Yeah, um, he's dead. But anyway, probably. so that's my that's my question of the week, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I guess one last thing: what you guys think of the uh, the return of the X Files? Um, if you haven't already commented on that, uh, just curious what you think about that. But uh, uh, have a great uh, week at work, guys, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye. All right, so that is yeah. that is Rob, right? There. Always with his great voicemails. Yeah, um, this is really one of my favorite callers. Yeah, as for you know, Tiny playing you know the killer in Anthropophagus remake. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he passed away what a couple years back. Oh yeah, a couple years, mm-hmm. couple years. I believe maybe in 2010. It's been a while since. Yeah, that it's been a while. Away, but, yeah, unfortunately, he had like big people syndrome thing. I he had issues, but, probably gigantism. Something like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, it brought up a lot of interesting questions yeah, and first and thing and stuff. is aliens. Yeah, first of all, I want to say I predate moods, so it wasn't just agreeing with moods. You can go check on my YouTube channel. I did a video a couple years ago called Most of Rated Horror Films, and I, oh, I on on recording, well, <clears throat> I said it before moods, so. You know what? My, you know, yeah. it's because mine is a little more current. Is because it was from the the overrated video you obviously watched on YouTube and uh, remaking my yeah. videos t- three years later. I see what you're doing. Wh- which I might add, I'm a little let down. I only got I haven't checked in a, in a couple of days, but I only had 15 thumbs downs on that video, and I was shooting for 20. <laughs> so I'm a little disappointed. I'm a little disappointed, disheartened that more people didn't take my shit a little more serious and you know hit that thumbs down button because. Mm-hmm. I got to say, man, you, you guys get super butthurt, and I love that. Keep them coming. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But that's probably why I brought that up, because it it's pretty recent. Yeah, yeah, so. I was just kidding, obviously. But as for George George Eastman, yes, I did know that he was the uh, he, uh, he was the killer in the mass parts in Stage Fright. Um, you know, George Eastman's had a really prolific career. I mean, he, he, a lot of people associate him with, you know, acting and stuff, but he's wrote a ton of stuff too. He's just one of those guys that you'd be surprised to attach his name to, you know, everything from like, a, you know, spaghetti westerns to action film to whatever. Like, he's done a lot of stuff. And I, th- I believe he was even uncredited in the Stage Fright film too. I can't remember. Did I bring it up when we were talking? You probably can't remember, but. Um, I can't. I don't think you did because I never. It, this seems so. Out of, like I never heard this before, so I doubt that you. you brought yeah, it. You I, I might know that. Though. I might have brought it up to George Eastman. I can't remember, but yeah, he's uh, he's got a really interesting career. If you kind of look at his acting and writing and directing career um, credits and stuff, he directed Metamorphosis in 1990, which Matt probably knows. Yep. Um, under an alias or pseudonym or whatever, but yeah, George Eastman. Yeah, cool. Um, as for the questions, who wants to go first on that? film that you would like to be remade by a certain director i'll go first uh as soon as i heard the question i instantly knew i instantly knew what i wanted you guys (laughs) i think i know what it is probably call it but i want robert bartley cummings to remake hellraiser i knew it was hellraiser yeah yes and for those of you who don't know who Robert Bartley Cummings is that is that is Robert Bartley Zombie. Yes. His middle name's Bartley. <laughs> what the kind of name is Bartley? Well, you can see why he changed his name to Rob Zombie. A little more badass. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think you know what's funny is uh Rob actually mentioned that, you know, Rob, Rob Zombie would be his pick for a film that I'd never seen, but I'm sure it would fit. And I, I think that that's oh, so interesting about choice. Rob Zombie, and it, it once again goes to you know it it helps with everything we say about him about how he's so unique because I really think you could take any film, probably any film, and and say like what would a Rob Zombie version look like, and you would probably be intrigued. Take a film that he mentioned earlier, Aliens. Alien. What would Rob Zombie do with Alien? You know, that's take a, any film, take, take literally take any film and, and you could seriously have an interesting conversation on what Rob Zombie would do with it. It's true. That is true. So, so what about you guys? Matt, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I would love to see Adam Green do nice. chopping ball. That could be fun. I can see Adam. I would like see, he would definitely I keep it. it cheesy. That's for sure. Yes. Chopping Mall has to be done cheesy. Um, 
I could see it like maybe instead of using a ro- the, the robots, maybe have it as the security system goes haywire, and then you, the security system is all wired because it's all everything's wireless now. It's yeah. all like a new technology. So the cameras are all wireless. Maybe some mannequins are wireless. <laughs> Everything. So all of a sudden the mannequins come to life and go after people. A uh, giant gate from the door comes crashing down and crushes somebody. You could add so much stuff like in the Mall of the Future and have Adam Green do this whole shebang about a, a pretty much a killer shopping plaza. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I would love nice. to see that. I'm honestly surprised Adam Green hasn't done a remake <clears throat> yet considering he's... Uh, He's literally talked about being attached to several different remakes from Scream all the way to Friday the 13th over the years on his podcast and still has not done one. Adam nice. Green, if you're listening to this, do Chopping Mall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Hi, sure Adam. he would if he had the budget for that. That sounds like a oh, budget. Yeah. What about you, Moods? Uh I'm going to go back to the old – I've mentioned this many times in you know, random videos and just conversations and stuff. And I really think that there's an awesome movie in the 1980 Blood Beach film. It, you oh, know, wow. it's, you know, I've heard people even argue the fact that it kind of has a remake in Tremors. You know, it's basically about you know, these creatures and stuff that are you know, feeding on people at the beach and stuff. And, but the movie kind of falls flat when you watch it. And I think that remaking this movie would be kind of cool. Like I think you could do it really well. And I would give the directing uh, task to Neil Marshall on this. Um, I think he could do a good job with it. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar with Neil Marshall, he directed Dog Soldiers, uh, The Descent, among things. Well, they did kind of do a, not necessarily a remake to Blood Beach called The Sand. Yeah. Where it was on the beach and on the sand. and Yeah, we mentioned that really that about <laughs> Jeremy's Vagina before, actually. <laughs> what kind of creatures were <laughs> in that one, though? I know, but I actually want this movie to be called Blood Beach and just be like... Who yeah. was the director, Modes? I didn't hear that. Uh, Neil Marshall. Oh, okay. Dog Soldiers. Yeah, Dog just Soldiers. Heck, he doesn't. I, I didn't even consider him, but interest. Yeah, he's good, man. Yeah, and of course he did the Descent, right? So yeah, I'm yeah. thinking kind of creatures, yeah. and, you know, and his really interesting visuals and stuff. But I think that could be an interesting pick. I do have a couple more because I always go up and above, you know, because okay. I'm just ridiculous like that. But the 1977 film Deathbed, you know, the bed that eats people, you know, that <laughs> film right there. Yeah. I would love to see. <laughs> this guy come back and do horror films, but I would love to see David Cronenberg's <laughs> oh, vision body on, horror from hell <laughs> on deathbed. Wouldn't that just be something else to see? Yes. I was actually thinking about David Cronenberg maybe doing extra. Oh yeah, oh that would be That'd a good be, one. Yeah, I was just thinking like that would be interesting. Actually, All that body horror to that. That's that's very fitting. Um, speaking on uh, Rob, whatever you wanted to call him, but I'll just call him Rob Zombie. Um, <laughs> Remaking. Robert Bartley Cummings. <laughs> Bartley Cummings. Man, that Bartley. name is dorky. <laughs> Sorry, but that's pretty funny. And Paul Pfeiffer was less dorky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Bartley, come on. <laughs> Bartley, yeah, that name is funny. Sounds like uh, he needs to wear overalls. And his have parents must have hated out. him. Yeah, that's ew, that's vicious, man. That's vicious. Ugh. Uh, yeah, um... Rob Zombie directing a remake of Toby Hooper's 1981 the film Funhouse. The Funhouse. Yes, that would be awesome. I'm that would be cool. That. I think Rob Zombie could do something really crazy with that because you know we got this. The setting of the film, first of all, is just so Rob Zombie, mm-hmm. right? We got this carnival. We got the we got creatures. We got cre- I think he could really fuck that film right up. It'd be awesome. Um, next up here. It's a film that I've said that needs a remake because I like the premise of this film. I've never really been an overly huge fan. To be honest, I should have put this in my overrated because people always give this film a lot of credit and stuff. And I'm like, why? It's not really that great. It's it's very well known from the 80s. And I don't know why it gets so much praise. But 1984 is Night of the Comet. You guys know this film. Screen Factory released it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Things like that. I like the premise of the film. I think they just don't execute the movie properly. And I'm going to give it to a guy that you know I think that could do something because – for me, he's proved himself as being a very versatile director. He's not very well known, but he is somebody that I love. And he had one of my favorite movies of 2014 um, in Chocolate, Strawberry, Vanilla. And I'm referring to Stuart Simpson. If you guys are unfamiliar with him, he did The Demons Among Us. And he also did Monstro, which was like a really kind of cool like throwback kind of 50s creature feature type film. You ever seen it, Matt? Monstro? Yeah, Monstro. I need to look that one up. 
It's got three real hot chicks on it. And honestly, dude, the cover, it's called El Monstro. Uh, El Monstro Del Mar, I think is what it's, what it's called. And it's fantastic, dude. It, it, it's a really cool film. I think you would really enjoy that. But I think given the, tr- uh, you know, directing to him, I think you could do something with that. I got one more. I got one more. I know I'm just overdoing this here, but. Yeah, you are. 1984 is <laughs> Savage Streets, the Linda Blair film, the Rape Revenge film. Mm-hmm. Yep. Give that film to Adam Wingard. Let him redo that film. Mm-hmm. And that's That'll it. be cool. Yeah. Yes. You know what? I, I thought of Adam Wingard for something a little maybe out there. Maybe some people wouldn't uh, consider this one. But uh, Pumpkinhead. Yeah, I mean, sure. I I, I, mean, I would like to maybe see like a nice remake of Pumpkinhead. I don't know. I, would, I mean, I don't really want to see Pumpkinhead remade. I was trying to pick films that I really do actually th- – think that'd be cool to see remakes of even though deathbed is like very unique in itself but i think a remake could be done savage yeah. is, is like is a decent film but i think anna wingard the way he's been going in his films like with the guests and things like that and and of course um you're next All right. you know i think this is a perfect one i, I got one i got one Th- this will end on this one i want all the new school cats to remake masters of horror boom there we go and what are these? What are the new school cats? Uh, like Adam Green, Adam Wingard, Joe Lynch, uh, Eli Roth, even Robert Zombie, <laughs> Robert Bartley Cummings, <laughs> Stuart uh, Simpson. Get Stuart Simpson in there. Bas- basically, Simpson. all the all the all the guys who've made an impact over the last you know fifteen ish years in horror. <laughs> Cronenberg James was never Wallen. on the Masters of Horror, was he? No, no. There was Wes Craven yeah. was never on it. Which is it's because when David Cronenberg, you know, when they started Masters of Horror in what five, six, oh, six or whatever, Cronenberg wasn't doing horror films anymore. So who knows? Maybe they maybe they attempted to ask him, and he's just like, no. I don't think George did one either, huh? I think Del Toro did no. one either. No, no. Well, Del- no. There's a there's a lot of directors that you think would be part of that, but I mean, yeah. I guess this that's is why I need to fucking reboot it. Wes Craven's never going to get a chance now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. All that right. does that does suck, but. Yeah, so uh, that's one voicemail. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, next, we, we, this one, I, I believe it. Well, the beginning was cut off, but I think that I'm I'm not sure, but it might be Emperor Corndog, and I think he does squeeze in a question. So uh, let's play that one up. Try to phone the fuck up. Uh, yeah, and and basically chime in with my thoughts on these movies because I, I really do love the original Cat People quite a bit. I actually do prefer it to the remake. I know the remake is brilliant but um, and the David Bowie song uh, Rest in Peace David Bowie there is an actually awesome cover version by Danzig of all people so if you want to check that out um, but I do love the remake but the original just has something that I think is very unique for a movie from the 1940s and uh, one of the first uses of jump scares and all of that. It's a very classic uh, piece of work and I do love that. So I figured I'd ask you all a question that leads into the subject of transformation movies. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, classic werewolves and uh, now we have cat people, what is uh, an animal, I seem to always be t- talking about animals whenever I call in, but what is an animal that you'd like to see a human transform into on screen in a horror film? And what do you think would be the nastiest of all transformations? Uh, if I had to pick one, I would have to go with, like, some kind of arachnid, uh, a spider, maybe. I, I don't know. I think the idea of, of doubling appendages from four to eight would be uh, pretty gnarly. But in any case, uh, yeah, so I hope you guys uh, have fun with that little discussion, and I will see you all pretty soon. Uh, until next time, God damn it, uh, have yourselves a good time, and uh, try not to catch VD. I'll speak with you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, thanks, Corn Dog. disease in our future. Yeah, you know what I Corn mean. Dog is so uh, random, man. I know, and I love that about point. him. I always wonder if he's still listening. You know, like I never know because you don't hear from him for months at a time, and then all I truly sudden, believe oh. that he listens to all of them because he says that he does, and I think he does. Like he just pipes in on cat people. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty awesome, man. But yeah, thanks for the awesome uh, voicemail, Corn Dog. That's always good to hear from you, bud. Yeah, I um, believe he was our first ever voicemail e. Yeah, that, that's so cool when you, you chime in, man. That's that's great stuff. Yeah, the original cat people, man, with the original jump scares and stuff. We agree, man. We we talked about that in the, you know, in the in the review and stuff like that. Um, as for people transformations into a certain animal, hands down, beaver <laughs> from Zombievers. 
<laughs> maybe people transforming into a beaver. I don't know, man. I just I would love to see that. I think that would be really funny. I think and, it kind of happened in zombie beavers, didn't it? Yeah, they kind of there were zombie beavers like they grew the teeth and the tail. Kind of, but I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, but I'm going with armadillo. <laughs> Damn. That's a tough one. That's yeah, a tough that'd be kind of cool. They could turn into a little ball and just roll away. She could pick <laughs> you up and throw you and smash you against someone's head. Yeah, that's true. Ar- yeah. Arachnid's pretty good. I do remember there was in ticks, there's like a tick that kind of morphs out of a body into like a giant tick that kind of is like arachnid y. Uh, shit, man. Human into shark. Let's see that. You guys were talking about sharks earlier. Hammerhead. Human into sharks. Ah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So uh, moving <laughs> on here, we have two voicemails from Lawrence. Uh, one of them is very short, and we could quickly answer it. So we'll play that one first. Hey guys, it's Lawrence. <clears throat> I'm just wondering. I saw a trailer for an upcoming horror comedy, and I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on it. The title is Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Now, I don't know if you know too much about this, but I was wondering yeah. what kind of thoughts, if any, which I'm sure you have some thoughts on a title like that, but what are they? Anyway, guys, have a great night, and, uh, well, actually, you did these in the morning, so have a good morning. <clears throat> Bye. All right, okay, so, so Lawrence, <laughs> to my knowledge, now I'm pretty sure most people that are you know into literature or whatever know what Pride and Prejudice Prejudice is. Um, it's Jane Austen's film or book from what 1815 or 1813 or probably 1813 maybe. And um, so basically, what it is, this author Seth Graham Smith, he basically took Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice book took that material and kind of incorporated zombies into that story. So he, it's kind of a mashup story with her original themes and stuff and and involving zombies. So it's a newly written book that came out a few years back. This is something 2009. Yeah. So I remember I have seen this in the bookstore quite a bit and I always wanted to check it out. And that's really interesting that they're, you know, doing this into a film, which kind of makes sense but that's really what it is so yeah i actually didn't even ever hear of the 1813 novel ever but i did know that pride and prejudice and zombies was a novel so that's kind of weird that i didn't know about that i believe that pride and prejudice is like one of the top selling novels like of all time yep like books of all time yep i don't really read so i wouldn't know that Unless yeah. it's Stephen I mean, King. I mean, but, it's it's one of those things that like I know about, but I, you know, I generally wouldn't pick the book up to read it because just the material. I heard it's really good, but I think you kind of have to be into what it is. It's kind of like, kind of a growing coming of age type deal and family with morals. It, it's type, It's one of those type stories, you know, t- kind of thing. Not really my thing. I'm generally reading Stephen mm-hmm. King novels, so. I think <laughs> yeah. it's going to be the next Abraham Lincoln versus vampires movie. Oh God, man, dude! <laughs> I've told a story on here before. I read that book before they ever announced the film and when they announced the film i was so i was like excited i was like oh that's so cool because the book was fucking kick ass it was like yeah. so it was so good to read and then i watched the movie and i was like fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a good it wasn't a good ad, uh, adaptation of it all so yeah. this is what this is gonna be it's gonna be a bad adaptation there yeah, Did I you... would actually like to read this book first. Actually, it would be kind of funny to read Jane Austen's book, then read the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies book, and then watch me I'd just get all that. It, you'd really kind of, you know, build a, an opinion on that shit. But M- Moods is such a jokester. Like, he's ever going to have time to read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, actually, I read all the time, man. I really do. I really do. You know, you know that Edgar Allan Poe that I made that meme out of for Jeremy? Yeah, that meme. Yeah, I remember that's that actually my book. I took that picture. Meme, meme, whatever. I that's my. I read that shit all the time. I read Edgar Allan Poe stories when Elger. I have Elgar Allan <laughs> Poe stories when I have downtime. But I think this could be interesting, man. I would like to read the material before seeing the movie, though. Mm. Yeah, Honestly. well, no, no matter what, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Then books it's always better when you read it if first. If it's anything like <laughs> Abraham Lincoln Vampire. Hunter, of course. Yeah. yeah. All right, but you know, short and long of that is we actually. I doubt, and I haven't seen the trailer. I doubt Moods has. No, I definitely have not seen the trailer. No. Matt. Nope, I have not seen okay, it. Okay, so let's move on to Lawrence's final question, which is also the final voicemail. Hey guys, it's Lawrence again. Since my original Valentine's 
same day question kind of got kiboshed only because you guys already addressed it in a previous podcast. I thought I'd ask you something else related to the Valentine's Day. What would be your favorite kills that would have some kind of relation to Valentine's Day? It doesn't have to be direct. I mean, tell me what your favorite kills are with an arrow or involving a heart. And maybe there's something else you can think of. Maybe something involving chocolate. I don't know. Maybe going to the house <laughs> of wax and just pour chocolate over someone and let it harden and suffocate them to death. Or maybe Jason Voorhees jumps out of the tunnel from hell and will he walk in the chocolate factory eating some fan fiction, grabs a kid by the neck hey, and drowns him in the river of chocolate while the paddle wheels smack him in the face. Zombie Oompa Loompas. just come up with fan fiction there. <laughs> yeah. so. Anyway, anyway, uh, stay awesome, guys, and have a great day. <laughs> All right, Lawrence. So I want to go first so you guys don't steal my thunder. Uh, my favorite arrow-related kill is probably that I can think of is Sleepaway Camp One, with uh, the dude just it, it's it's filmed so well because you're like how how'd that happen and you watch it in freeze frame and it still it still looks good even when you slow it down. Uh, that that's a great great kill. Love yeah it. yeah truly do. Um, my chocolate related kill. Hmm, you didn't guys didn't think I would have one of these, huh? Huh? Uh, oh, no. Friday the 13th Part 5. We'll find Vic. I don't want to share it anyway. <laughs> Whatever the fat dude says. <laughs> you see the chocolate bar. <laughs> and and it's like, just gets so pissed. <laughs> he just gets so pissed and he kills him. And I, it's like, I always thought that was sad. But at the same time, he was kind of being annoying. And I think his name was Joey. And they're like, geez, Joey, you're getting chocolate everywhere. And he's like, fine. I, I see I'm not wanted over here either. Hey, Vic, how you doing? <laughs> um, I truly love part five, and fuck all the haters. Part five kicks ass, and uh, that death is one of my favorites in the series. Huh. That's very interesting. I don't have one for a heart. Um, well, I'll go. <sighs> yeah. Okay, so Arrow, I think, it's, I think it's a bow. Am I seeing this correctly, or is it a crossbow, or is it a bow and arrow? I can't quite... Remember right now, oddly enough, but the the scene from Friday three, uh, where what's her name is in the water there, and he tags her right through the it's eye, a, like harpoon. Well, that's a harpoon. Spear. The harpoon. Same. That's I'm cheating. Harpoon. I'm cheating. Yeah, that's that one sucks. <laughs> Nay, nah, sucky. That's Move nah, on. That's, it's kind of the same thing. Nope, really. nope not the same. Nope. <laughs> I uh, agree with JP. It's not the same. <laughs> Okay. Um, as for Hartman, the first thing that came to my mind was the scene from from Dust Till from Dust Till Dawn, where Fred <laughs> Williamson rips the heart out of the or the out of the vampire. Fucking yeah. love that scene, man! I Good absolutely stuff. love that scene. That was like literally the first thing. Should have probably thought about the the bow and arrow one a little harder but. what about friday nine when uh dude eats jason's heart that's a pretty good one huh yeah no that's a, that's a good one yeah <laughs> oh, right. i got something for you all right for my favorite bow scene will probably be in uh bloody birthday with the little peephole oh that's a good sister. one not bad and she the little girl sets it all up and she's like what the fuck and all of a sudden boink, yeah that's like right the up. only th- the memorable thing i remember from that movie not a big My fan. favorite heart scene would be in Hello Mary Lou Prom Night 2, where she's with the guy's best Oh, yeah. And she's sitting there talking with him on the couch. He's in, like, this weird martial art garb and everything. She's like, you know what? You have such a great heart for a friend. And, she's, and he's like, yeah, you're right. She goes, do you want to see it? And just rips her hand right <laughs> through the guy's fucking chest. And it goes right to the couch, and she's got his, his heart in his hand. Oh, that's Something. funny. <laughs> I laugh my ass off every time I see that scene. Poof! That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so that wraps up the voicemails. I believe Moods, don't you have some questions for us this time? Do I have some questions? Yes. Um, I can't remember who actually wrote these. I should have probably wrote the name down, but I do have a couple questions. Just pretty much wanted to clarify um, – Mostly, you know, talking to me and JP, like how we got our YouTube names. He said that he knew how Jeremy got his because he obviously heard on the podcast, like how Jeremy got his name and stuff. Uh, but he wanted to know how we got our names. So, JP, if you want to go. Uh, Double Shot J, I assume, 
or not JP, correct? <laughs> Double shot, Jay. Yeah. Uh, JP was my name because there was – I'll just answer this one anyway. Because uh, <laughs> there was a lot of Justins in the 90s. I was born in 1991, and I think I had like – four Justins in my elementary school class, another two in the next class, and another three or four in the grades above and below me. And then when I got to high school, it just got insane. But, you know, I, I quickly wanted to abandon being known as everybody else. So yeah. I, I uh, you know, people started calling me JP. That's how that one went. And Double Shot J, that's actually kind of an interesting one. Uh, I don't know if anybody really knows this on YouTube, but... Uh, basically, Double Shot was a name of a little rap crew I was in when I was 16. And it was, uh, it, it started, there was another name before that, but it was Double Shot was when we broke off and did a duo thing. It was two people and it was me and my cousin. And then eventually it was me, my cousin left and it was me and, uh, the dude that I used to rap with early on. And, I was double shot J and you know, he was double shot S or, you know, double shot B or whatever. Uh, and it was just, you know, it, it was just easier to kind of tell us apart or whatever. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll play at the end of this episode. I'll actually put in a little clip from, from my rap days, you know, <laughs> obviously not very good. <laughs> you know, I was 16. I probably do better now. Still not good though. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, that, that's how that's where my name stemmed from. You know what? We'll have a we'll have a verse, man. I'll, I'll throw you up one of my songs, and then we'll have people vote on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got a couple albums worth of tracks, so beat that player. <laughs> um, yeah, how I got my name? Uh, basically, Moods is a nickname I got when I was, I believe, I was around twelve or thirteen. Um, my my best friend. Uh, who's now passed away, he actually gave me the nickname because <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to be, well, I always say it's very, I was very passionate about everything, but people would always just kind of call me a spaz. <laughs> you know, I'd freak out about shit. So, you know, my name being, my real name being Mike, uh, people would always, you know, he started calling me like Moody Mike. He's like, man, you are so moody all the time. Like one minute you're happy, the next minute, blah, blah, blah. And it just got shortened from there. They just, people just started calling me moods. And that's just, it just stuck because it, it was just catchy or whatever. So of course I took that nickname, just incorporated into my YouTube name. As for the 616, um, the 616 came from an article I read online. <laughs> I'll never forget this too because it was kind of funny. It was like from a legit source and everything. And it was about this reporter. He was doing an investigation on like the, the number 666 and like how it wasn't actually the number of the beast. And this guy's article, it was, it was almost like a thesis. He was like really trying to prove that he was really trying to prove that the number of the beast was actually 616. And it was like for sure. And all I could think about was, man, if he actually proves this is correct, Iron Maiden's going to be so fucking mad. <laughs> you know, it's the whole time I could think about, right? So the article, I read the whole thing. It was long too. And it made me laugh. And I was like, you know what? I, and when I first jumped on YouTube, I wanted to name myself Just Moods. Of course, it was taken with that exact spelling too. I was like, holy shit, really? But so I put the 616 on there because, and it worked. So. That's how I ended up with Mood 616. Yeah. <laughs> it's all from a fucking Yeah, I always thought the 616 was an area code. Actually, I've, I've been asked that before. Is that an area code? I'm like, no, no, huh. this is the story. <laughs> yep. All right. What about you, Matt? <clears throat> Matt. Hmm. My mommy and daddy no, gave no, me that no, name. No, no, no. <laughs> you and your horror movies, guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, pretty much with you and your horror movies was I was debating on when I was building my channel. And before doing videos, I had to think of what would I want to be called. And one time I was sitting there talking with my wife, and uh, I would list off these weird movies to her. And she would always reply to me, Matt, you and your horror movies, where do you come up with these titles? <laughs> like, I don't come up with them. Other companies come up with them. She was like, but how do you know about them? No one's probably ever heard of this movie. I go, they probably have. It's probably from the 80s. Such and such and such and such. And she's like, yeah, you and your horror movies. And that's there where I go. got it from. There you go. <laughs> I it's, love, all, it's all credit to her. I love awesome. that story. Yeah. <laughs> that and great. she still does it too now. Like, I'll put out a movie like maybe Deathbed, The Bed That Eats. And she's like, what? Oh, yeah, it's a killer bed. There's a demon possessed in it and melts people in this yellow piss liquid. 
<laughs> which is really, <laughs> really a cool movie, by the way. Cult Epic. It is. Shout out to them. Yeah, it's a fucking really cool film, man. And then they got the skeleton hands and everything. Yeah. It's hysterical. But she just gives me that look like, you and your horror movies, and just she walks <laughs> onto the kitchen. That's awesome. Like, yes. I love that. Um, as for the second question, uh, he wanted to know why we always refer to this one channel as the old review channel, and we never say the name. Um, and he wanted to know, was Jeremy and JP a part of it? Um, I yes. was a founding member of that shit, dog. Yeah, me and JP. Uh, Jeremy was actually brought on about the same week it collapsed. He never did do a review. So technically he was, but he wasn't. So, no, but me and JP, we did, uh, I think it lasted 39 weeks. Yeah. And we did we did all 39 weeks. We never missed a review. It was, uh, it was called The Fright Tube. Uh, it's it still called- an active YouTube channel. I think it's like X, The Fright Tube X or something, if you do want to check it out. But, uh, you know, basically... What happened there was Tattoo Doorman, who was an old school YouTuber, he's not really around anymore. He contacted me and my boy Steve, Steve Ferrandino from the Jack Frost episode, and he asked us if we wanted to join a week, a daily review channel, which seven days, everybody gets a day, do a review. And I said, yeah, Steve said, yeah, and then we pulled in Moods. He was actually the seventh and final member on Sunday. Uh, Danny, DJ Boy, numbers 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 was part of it 3275 3275 was part of it uh, a guy named in dipstick we trust was on it uh and then there was uh tim i believe right yeah okay yeah. So, so tim was the leader he was the creator of the freight tube and th- this channel actually existed before that too and it was it got shut down or it ended in 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 bad blood or whatever, you know, a year or two before this. So this was like the reboot of, of the Fright Tube. Basically, it went pretty good for a while. Uh, that's where we really started like Skyping. We didn't do it in Skype, but we, we that's when we started like co- conversating in like chats and stuff. We was having a blast every mm-hmm. every night or every weekend night. We'd all be hanging out, shooting the shit like we do now. And uh, basically, one of our fill-in guys, still on YouTube, his name's Bones, uh, he came in and, and we were talking about the, the burial grounds podcast thing that we were starting up the video chat, you know, he came in not in camera form, just in, in text and he was like, Hey guys. And we were like, Hey, and then, um, apparently he thought we was ignoring him. He went and told the leader of the freight tube, Tim, Tim came in tripping shit. We basically called him out on a bunch of bullshit and it was, uh, pretty much just a, a big heated battle thing. He pretty much honestly, like I'm not, I'm not even kidding. Like he, he went crazy over nothing. Yeah. And you know, to make it a little shorter, he fucking deleted all the videos on the channel, shut down the fucking thing. So me and JP said, well, we still want to do this. So we gathered up. Well, everybody literally from the six team, out of the seven members, not and the seventh member was still. Tim. So we grabbed another member, I believe which was Jeremy. Yeah, I think. And we started up uh, body bags and it's still going. We're 125 weeks deep. Yeah, I think no we're in week drama. 120, 126. Literally no drama. drama. We've had a lot of people come and go out of the channel, which is fine. It's Including understandable. Me? People, you know, JP. Yeah, <laughs> still still, the you know, the the, the whole or he's still the, the mastermind or whatever you want to call it. It's still his channel technically. Um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's still going. It's going good. You know, Matt's part of it. He is, like we said, he's the Friday guy. I yeah. never changed days. I've always been the Sunday guy. I was the Sunday guy on the Fright Tube, Sunday guy on Body Bags. and I was originally the Wednesday guy. Yeah. yeah. People have moved around. I, I've pretty much done every day except for Sunday. I got a crazy streak going, man. I never missed a review on Fright Tube 39 weeks. I never missed one on Body Bags 125 weeks. So that's like 100 and whatever 60 weeks plus i've done fill-ins yeah, <laughs> so i've got like this cal ripkin uh iron man streak going right now man it's pretty awesome so so essentially there's 30 some reviews that i did that nobody will ever see uh you know because he went and deleted all the videos out of nowhere and pretty much we haven't talked to that guy ever since really i mean there was a little bit of backlash right away uh people made videos there was a little bit of back and forth but you know i don't give a fuck like i i'm not even mad over it anymore so no the the other guy was clive i think oh yeah Cl- Cl- yeah clive came in clive clive craven yeah he he was coming in towards the end i think he replaced like in dipstick we trust or something yeah 
and uh yeah i mean tat tat came over I, like literally we like seven or eight people came over from there because we had you know the seven reviewers plus like two mm-hmm. or three fill-in guys we everybody everybody joined us because we were right <laughs> yeah well we didn't do anything wrong so yeah, yeah. Which, I, but, I mean, I talk to Bones every once in a while. Like, I don't hold any grudges against that guy or anything. But, you know, it is what it is. It was just a bad experience, and we kind of just for, forgot about it. Till you brought it up, Mr. Question Asker. Yeah, I actually don't really <laughs> even think about it very often anymore. But, yeah. Yeah, probably way too much explanation. But he wanted to know, and we've mentioned it a bunch of times, so I figured I would go into it in detail. Yes, that is correct. Any more questions? <laughs> And that was never part of the fright tube. No. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> All righty. No, that was it for the questions. And that's it for the voicemails, too. Yeah, I and believe. I just got a few little feedback things here. Uh, so, yeah. first of all, the director of Gun Woman reached out to us via Horophilia, which is where you can find and subscribe to our podcast. And he said, My name is Karando Mitsutek. I directed Gun Woman. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my fans told me about your best of 2015 show, and I just checked it out. Thank you so very much for all your kind words. 10 out of 10 review was especially awesome. That was mine, baby. Yep, yep. <laughs> I was also very honored to be named best foreign film by some of the hosts. And yes, Remo Williams was one of my childhood favorites that I watched over and over. That's awesome. My latest film that I just finished called Karate Kill actually has more of a direct homage to reno williams i can't wait to get to get to direct a straight horror film someday and i would love you guys if you could i would love if you guys could review it thank you so very much for your wonderful show best regards karando mitsu take (laughs) nailed it that is really cool that he actually responded with that email like yeah you can tell he listened to the whole thing too because he (laughs) mentioned the awards and stuff yeah, that's actually really cool, man. Yeah, Pro- very, very interesting. Very cool. It's it really is such an amazing feeling to actually hear back from the directors and yeah, listen to us. And I truly meant that that guy's film was, was one of my favorites of the year. You know, maybe mm-hmm. the top four, I believe. And it's true. It's true. I love that movie, and it's one of the highlights of my year in terms of pure enjoyment. So thank you, sir, for for making I- that movie. I know I probably freaked you out too. Remember when I first watched it? I'm like, man, that was that was like awesome. It was like fucking yeah. crazy. You're, th- you're thinking, was, yeah. you're thinking fucking Asian, yeah. and you're like, oh man, this is gonna be like some crazy Japanese like fucking machine girl Tokyo Gore police shit, farting zombies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I told you, I said it was like straight up revenge film. It's yeah, it's serious. super it's awesome. good, it's super good. Really well so done. finally, the last little thing I want to do is get, last week we mentioned. Guys, rate us on iTunes, review us on iTunes, and uh, somebody actually went and did so. Uh, ratings, you actually have to have over five to have an average. So we didn't have over five before. Now we have six, so we at least got two since the last podcast, maybe even more. Thank you very much for that, guys. That's super awesome. We did say that we'll give something away. I believe Mood said uh, Nukem High Volume 2. Uh, if you guys give us randomly if you guys give us 10 reviews with by february 22nd and if you do that would be fucking awesome i I believe that's what the contest was but you know if i'm wrong somebody will point it out i'm sure but anyway we got an actual review too so this is our third review i think that's super cool from death metal god he says i've been listening to this podcast for over a year now and not only have i discovered a ton of movies from listening but it also is a great source for horror news, awesome reviews. The hosts of this show, Moods and JP, are super friendly, which we are, and really know what they're talking about. Well, one of us does. When it comes to horror, I've listened to the other podcast in the I've listened to other podcasts in the past, but none compared to this one. They have even inspired me to start a YouTube channel of my own. Show these guys some support and subscribe. Anthony Crisanti, which I do know him. That's an awesome guy. And uh, yeah, dude, thank you for that review. Kind words. This is that's one of the reasons why I do it. I'm not sure about modes, but I just love hearing people say that they, you know, just honest opinion, honest feedback. It doesn't even have yeah, to be man. positive. 
I love hearing I love hearing that feedback. And he is right. You know, they're you know or JP, you are right. One person does know what they're talking about. It's definitely not me. Well, I was about to say, I didn't <laughs> actually say who that one person was. So. No, no, no. I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a damn clue half the time. Look at me, man. I'm fucking up like bone arrow scenes in Friday 3 and shit. I don't know what the <laughs> wait, hell Wait, 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 wait. You're the new Jeremy. You tried to pin that <laughs> shit on me a couple episodes ago, but you're the new Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, no. No, I, I don't have a sandy vagina. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just not gonna work. Texas Chainsaw Massacre two. <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre two. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So that that is all the feedback for this episode, guys. Thanks everybody for the voicemails and the questions. And uh, yes. Um. Yeah, we haven't done one of these segments in a while, but uh, you know, every once in a while, we kind of pop one of these out of nowhere. And uh, it's a segment called Knowledge. And basically what that is, we just talk about something that's going on, whether it be – well, it's always related to horror films. In this case, for today, we are going to be talking about or discussing what I think is kind of a travesty a little bit because unfortunately it affects me more than you guys. But Snaps Films' release of uh, Tenembrae, the Steelbook. Yes. So what is the fucking deal with this? That is the question. Okay, so a little backstory. Uh, we have been expecting a couple Argento films from Synapse for quite a long time now. They announced them a while ago. And, you know, they were getting closer and closer. They kept teasing them. They finally announced the first one coming to Blu ray. And it is Tenebre, like Mood said. But there's a little catch it is a limited edition, three disc set. By limited, I actually mean limited. 3,000 units being made. 3,000, yeah. Each includes a Blu-ray, a DVD, and a soundtrack CD. In a collectible stillbook packaging, it also has a little booklet. One of the special features is Yellow Fever, The Rise and Fall of the Giallo, which is a documentary. Sounds awesome right there. Full that length. Would, full length. Full length. Feature length uh, documentary there. And, the, you know, right away, that's something that would be super interesting to me because I – don't really know a lot about giallos and that would definitely help me out so it has a commentary track uh by a film critic it has a booklet it has chapter selections which is listed in the special features uh (laughs) high definition uh insert shots feature length documentary which we've mentioned original unseen end credits meaning that they've never been released i guess uh alternate opening credits Japanese shadow theatrical trailer includes bonus CD with uh, all the music from the thing, 19 tracks. So honestly, it, it looks more stacked than it actually is when I'm actually reading off the chap, the, the special features. That feature link yeah. documentary is definitely the best feature there. But the thing about although the soundtrack, here, the soundtrack is is very cool too. But okay. you know, we'll get more into that in a minute. But so so one of the the catches here is that. The, the the price of this is thirty nine ninety five plus shipping, which is six dollars for U.S. for, if for you US. Are, if you're international or if you're in Canada, it's fourteen. It's fourteen dollars shipping. After conversion, it's seventy eight dollars and forty four cents. I did the math. I I went to go check out. I wanted to see what it was worth because our dollar sucks right now. Holy fuck is all I can say. Yeah. Well, m- my thing here is it, that's not where it ends. No, no. So totally. I, re- I, I reached out in terms of comments on Facebook. And that I was, was just like, me saying it affects me more than you guys. Yes. So yeah. I, I went over to Synapse's Facebook page and I, I, I scrolled through. I read some stuff. I asked some questions of my own. One thing I asked is, will it be available on Amazon? Because it's obviously suggested retail price thirty nine ninety five. I figured if it goes to Amazon, then it'll at least be, you know, $5, maybe $10 cheaper, which is a little bit more fair. Get the prime shipping, stuff like that. And, you know, then it's, it's kind of worth it. You can, you can make an argument for it. No, this is going to be DVD, DVD diabolic.com or whatever that site is. Diabolic DVD. Diabolic DVD.com and, uh, synapsefilms.com exclusive. So the, those are the only places you can get it. I also asked, and many other people asked too, many, many other people, is there going to be a standard edition similar to how you did with Demons 
uh, one and two still book. And yeah. every time they replied, there is no plans for another release. You no. sh- sometimes they said at this time, which to me is a complete honey dick move. Perfect. Honey dick. Because honey they're dick. trying to persuade us into doing something that is going to benefit them when knowing more details than they actually want to give us, which in my opinion, absolutely a hundred percent, there will be a, another edition. There will be yeah. a either bare bones or, or lesser version in a regular Blu-ray keep case. It'll be what they did with demons. You know, they released the steel books and then they released the standard editions without the special features. Which I don't even know if they would do that though. I, I, I honestly think that they would, they might even do the, there'll be features on it too. It's just not still book. It's, it doesn't have the CD. Or the book, yeah. I, yeah. I could see him doing that too. You know, I know they did that with demons and stuff, but maybe the I, I think that the backlash might get to him, and they might release it with features or something like that. But what, what my question to you guys, you and Matt and the listeners, is: is there something wrong with this to to tra- to limit something? Because we've seen this with Nightbreed and uh, overpriced. I think it was like seventy dollars or something. Yeah, uh, the Scream Factory. But when they announced it, they said, "Hey guys, look, look, look! You don't have to buy this. This is a premium product. If you want the regular edition with a little less features and a, a two disker, we got that too. We got you covered. You can still see the film. Yeah. So and you know the thing about that is that they're being upfront and they're being honest. That's the problem here now when the demons were released on steelbooks demons one and two did they say they were going to release a standalone of the originals down the road or was it way way down the road that they were going to be released it it wasn't at first i believe it was you know i think i think maybe what happened with that was you know the sales weren't doing as well as they thought they were going to do and then they just decided to announce that Hey, there's a standard edition coming out. It's not going to have any features. And I think that's where they were trying to make the run. As far as I know, they're still not even sold out. Yeah, they're still in stock of those Demons titles. Yeah, like you can still find them at Di- Diabolic. And I mean, when I was at Wasteland, I, there, they had stacks of them there. Mm-hmm. Like it was crazy. Like people just weren't willing to spend the money for them. So I don't know if they didn't learn from that. I don't know what's going on here. But I can't imagine these guys not putting out standard editions of this. Well, but the me- problem. Good. But this is this is this is what my whole thing was. It's, it's it, you know, it's good that you mentioned the the Nightbreed situation where they said yes, this is a premium product, and if you want the lesser product, it's going to be available. So they told you up front, right here, if they end up dropping the Tenebrae standard editions without the features and without the soundtrack or whatever, you know, later, and but even though they're saying right now that they're they have no plans to do it, that's fucking bullshit, man. All they're doing is straight honey dicking, man. Yeah, so what I want to ask you is, okay, obviously there is some exploitation of companies that, that are that are trying to get your money. They're trying to make sales. That's fine. I'm cool with that. I have no problem with minor exploitation of us because that's what they're there, there to do. It's a business. But at, when does the line cross? When is the line crossed? It, to me personally – Lying is crossing the line. <laughs> okay. Lying. They know when they're fu- they they're telling us right now. There's no standard. No, it's nothing planned. Fucking bullshit. They totally have this shit planned. They're just telling people because they want us to all run out, all three thousand of us purchase this shit up, and then they're gonna go <laughs> and then drop the fucking standard editions. Yeah, I think that. So basically, they're overcharging for one film. This is one film, guys. It's three discs. One is a DVD. That doesn't count. It does not count. You know, it, I mean, technically it counts. It is three discs. But I'm saying that there's nothing bonus there. It's just a fucking DVD copy, right? Exactly. So you got a Blu-ray and a CD, all right? You mm-hmm. got a Steelbook. Does that – I mean, Steelbooks don't even appeal to me really. I guess they're kind of I'm, cool. I'm not I'm not a big Steelbook collector either. I mean, the film is where it's at and the features and stuff. I mean, I'd be happy – if they put it out like Grindhouse puts out with theirs. And what the fuck, man? That's This is exactly what I'm talking about. Like, Grindhouse is putting out, you know, very similar dish, way more features, you know, soundtracks, everything, and they're selling for fucking half the price. Is, yeah, it, the steel, the price. is it the fucking steel book that we're paying for? I don't get this, man. This is bullshit. I mean, 
I, I've always been a big supporter of Synapse Films. I have a ton of releases by these guys. This really pisses me off that they're lying. They, they are lying through their fucking teeth by saying that they're not putting out a standard edition. They're honey dicking, man. <laughs> you, you, know, you know what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, you know, we didn't sell enough copies of the steelbook. Oh, they're gonna. You know what? We'll put out a, a, a standard edition. So in case somebody wants the steelbook, it's there. If not, you can buy the regular yeah. edition. They're just trying to weasel out. Ev- they're trying to sell these three thousand copies because it's gonna be bank for them. They sell these things, you know, at the price they're selling them for. Of course, they're making money off this, man. But don't tell us that you know they have no plans to release a standard. Why wouldn't they? It's just more money for them. Yeah, it's yeah. bad. It's bad business not to release it. I mean, they did with with demons. You know, I mean, come on. How many? I bet you they sold more copies of the standard edition D, uh, demons D, uh, Blu-rays than they did of the fucking steel books. Well, with the math, you're looking at about a hundred and nineteen thousand dollars, and and some change. Well, then they can take that money and finish the damn products for popcorn and Suspiria and Phenomena. Well, and the fucking Coffin Joe trilogy. Well, what and all I'm these saying other is, with titles the uh, announced. with with the thirty nine ninety five, they're they sell all 3,000 copies, it's $119,000 with some give or take change and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of money to be made by doing this. You know, I think the idea is that you you say you're – this is it. This is the edition that everybody's been wanting. Everybody's been waiting for this film, you know, and the other Argentos, which they're – you know, chances are they're probably going to do the same thing. And basically what they're doing is, you know, they they – who knows how much money they spent on it, right? Maybe they spent a hundred thousand dollars to get these films and to get it to get it tr- the yeah. chance for whatever. And, 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 and so I they're trying to that. make their money back really quickly by saying this is the only edition. Everybody runs out and buys it faster because it's a business tactic. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. And it, whether it is good or bad, that's kind of what we're deciding. It's but it's definitely shit. a business tactic. And I can't fault them a hundred percent because let's face it, more people are gonna buy it when you say only three thousand units, and that's of, it. Of than course, if you say we're gonna make another edition later. We know how this works. We know how this works. I mean, limited shit. People have to snag up. We know in this market, you know, you you, you have to go for it right away. It's the problem that they're saying over and over again currently there is no plans at this time because exactly. that, what you're saying there what is you're really is saying be- is there's plans just you know you're trying to lie without lying right? we're just not going to admit to ourselves at this present moment that we are going to release a standard edition of tenembre yeah it's exactly what they're doing and i mean this is one of those situations where it honestly made me dislike synapse a little bit because the, it's not even the lie so much. It's the idea that you think we will believe the lie. <clears throat> yeah. It's insulting. It, it's insulting to your fans. It, it, it is Find another insulting. way around it. Say we're not going to comment on that right now. Things are complicated. Yep. Say anything. But don't lie and say it's, that – It's the disrespect in the line that I just – I'm having a hard time with right now. It's not even the price. You know, I'll probably end up biting and paying the goddamn money but <laughs> – but, you know, it, it's just – it is, man. It's the bullshit, man. There, there's people that are not going to, you know, and it, it's just – it's just that deceit, man. I mean Synapse is such a such a premium company, you know. I understand this. Like, you know, and they must know this too because they do charge a lot for their shit. Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it did cost them a lot to get the rights or do all these features and stuff. And, yeah, it does cost money to, to do features. Maybe the soundtrack rights or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So, who knows? But I mean, it's, still, it's people still a lot from of going money. to Arrow. You can get the Arrow because that's what Blu-ray. the first thing I thought of. Seriously, I was like, you know what? I I held off on those Arrows. I want to oh, collect man. these Argento films. And what did I say on the podcast many times? I'm waiting for those Synapse. I'm waiting for those Synapse. I know, and and this, it was this disheartening, man. Thing. As soon as I seen the picture, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then instantly, when I seen the price and I seen that it's limited, first of all, I don't like limiting things, per because what they're saying is this is a limit, three thousand. That's it, right? I don't like that to begin with. That's some Twilight Time shit. Because w- w- what it is is you're denying people from seeing this film. Fuck that. Th- that's stupid. We're supposed to share this over. We're supposed to spread it around. It's it's art. It's Argento. It's Italian. It's, mm. it's history. Don't limit it. 
don't limit it. And we know you're not really going to, but since we only can go off what you say, you're saying you are. So that's yeah. a no big no no. And and the final thing I want to touch on because this really pisses me off. Okay, you're gonna charge me thirty nine ninety five, way more for moods in Canada. And then you're going to also charge me $6 shipping, not even $5 shipping, not even $4.95. You're not even going to absorb the shipping cost, maybe make the price $45.95, for, you know, $44.95, you know, whatever. You're going to actually charge shipping too. It just looks nasty. Make it all – it would have sold better if you was like it's going to cost, you know – $45 with free shipping. That sounds better to me than thirty nine ninety five with $6 shipping. Get out of here. Because the $6 yeah. shipping just seems like it's too much. See, I'm laughing about that. I'm like, $6 shipping? Giddy up, man. My 14 is like, ugh. That's, that's not cool. I understand where I am. I'm international, but give me a break. Yeah, did you check Diabolic, much. though? Um, it's Di- not on there yet. Diabolic shipping is very similar. It would cost me... I think one DVD Blu-ray type thing I think usually is about nine, ten dollars. So it's a little cheaper, you know. But it, you know, it, it'll be end up being a couple dollars cheaper. It's not. If you go on uh, Diabolic for their new titles, it's not listed yet. It's not listed yet. Yeah. This yeah, is so. what I'm hoping happens. I, I hope somehow Synapse like kind of just reinspects what they're doing and, and maybe just does a little change. Maybe just kind of goes about it in a little different way and i, I wish i, could I, re- I really remember. want to love synapse too because I, I know that they're sort of uh you know a little more they're not a scream factory they, they're they not heavy hitting with all this money and stuff they, they are a lower tier company and i do want to love them and i do want to support them and i do want them to you know succeed in in this hectic and cutthroat market but I just, I just really hate when and you, I feel like our intelligence is being insulted or, yeah, yeah, the shade. You know, I, you know, and, they, and they've been, good. they've been around for a while, man. It's not like they just started. Like, I mean, they've been around since what the early two thousands. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as I can remember, so they've been doing it. They've been putting out a lot of good stuff. But Synapse to me is like, it's kind of like a premium company because they put out such good quality stuff. You know, you never pick up a DVD and go, fuck, that transfer was shitty or that Blu-ray was shitty. Like, they do amazing work and I give them that credit. I mean, maybe that's why they have to charge so much. Maybe they they're, they they got to pay these guys the, the features and stuff. I understand this. But at the same time, you know, you look at – you take a company like Arrow and, you know, they have just as many features. You know, their transfers are just as good. Packaging, everything. Everything about Arrow is amazing and it's not even close to that price. <sighs> it, it, it just sucks, man. It really gets, does. But then you compare it to American company like Grindhouse, and they're doing very similar. They drop those soundtracks, everything. The transfers are phenomenal, and I don't. I just don't get it, man. You know. It, you it's know tough what? To, also, it's man. Absorb, I, man. Honestly, that uh, I'm not even crazy about the cover art they chose. Yeah, I, I mean, it's all right, but <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not blown. It's nothing not, that jumps out at it's you. Not, it's not blowing my mind either, but you know. <laughs> it's kind of a downer in the show. We're just like so yeah. fired by it. It's like, ah, uh. but you know, yeah, it is. You know what it comes down to? It's just, I feel like they're just kind of lying to us. You know, just come out and say, you're going to drop that standard, man. Let's be honest. There's people out there that, you know, buy your product and support. So don't, uh, don't treat us like shit. Don't alienate our fucking intelligence here. Yeah. Put out the special edition and then just put out a standalone. And then I bet you can make a ton of more money just by selling all the standalones versus all 3,000 copies. Yeah. We'll see what happens here, but let's let's uh, move on from this downer of a knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad knowledge. Bad. <laughs> uh, we probably sound like the biggest, like, raging fanboys nerds ever, by the way. <laughs> But it's just honesty, though, man. I mean, there's other people, too, that probably want to voice their opinion but can't be heard. At least we can get that out there. You know, the consensus is is that this is what we're hearing from people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's honestly, like, to be fair, there was a lot of hyped-ass people over on their Facebook pages. Like, oh, I can't wait. I pre-ordered, pre-ordered, pre-ordered. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, there are people. May, may, maybe we are a little bit of whiners, but maybe we look into things too much. Who knows? But I think we're just... I think we're seeing it how how it for like what it really is. Yeah. So so 
I, you know, I believe that's it. Yeah. All right. So, concluding mood swings, we'll get into the uh, morbid fact. The coroner's report, weird stats and morbid facts, courtesy of Rumor Magazine. This one is coming from issue 149, October of 2014. Uh, this was a very cool, this was the Halloween issue, the 17th anniversary Halloween issue. Stick is shit in my hand. I can't even bend the fucking magazine. Ugh, what's going on here? Um, I thought this was actually kind of funny. Um, I'm a big fan of Hunter Thompson, Hunter S. Thompson, so I thought this was actually just interesting i don't know in his book kingdom of fear hunter s thompson admitted that once he terrorized jack nicholson and his family with a tape of a pig being eaten a huge outdoor amplifier and a spotlight and a nine millimeter swift and wesson handgun <laughs> thompson <laughs> taught this <laughs> the odd birthday gift by leaving an elk heart on nicholson's doorstep <laughs> okay what a crazy guy hunter s thompson was a creepy or was a fucked up guy but man dude He's terrorizing Jack Nicholson. That's pretty awesome. I'm like, who does that? Who fucking wow. does that? But just to go to those lengths, too, it's just good stuff, man. Mad props. Mad props. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So getting into that part of the show that I always like to call the WWW part of the show. I know, you know, JP hates when I say that, but it refers to what we watched this week. No, no, no. That's Jeremy who hates that you say that. Yeah. I- I like what I we watched. Not this I, week, though. That's the part I don't like. Th- this week, whatever. I mean, this episode. Um, yeah, so basically what that is is just we talk about some films that we have watched during this past week <laughs> or whatever. Um, yeah, and that's what it is. And we go round table, give some ratings, and then move on. Matt, you want to start us out? All righty, then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is great. That is so great. Uh, Thank you first, <laughs> no problem. I've been wanting to do that. And I, after I'm thinking, how can I interpret that? How can I put that in there? All right. Uh, the <laughs> first movie I watched this week is, and uh, it's a creature feature, and uh, it was done by uh, who put this out? Uh, Sci-Fi Channel put it out, and it is Lake Placid Two. We would expect nothing less. I know, right? <laughs> I found the Blu-ray for cheap price on amazon it was like five bucks i think it was and it's the unrated edition so all the stuff they had on the tv is all taken out and all the good shit is put on on the blu-ray so you actually get nudity and you get a lot of gore i did not know that i have that dvd yep the unrated's got uh the blue uh boobs in it a lot of boobs. (laughs) so pretty much you have john schneider from dukes of hazard he plays the uh, local town sheriff. And, of course, they have the whole history from Lake Placid 1 happening. Um, the, ga- the alligators in the lake, blah, blah, blah. People go missing and everything. And, of course, uh, Cloris Leachman plays Betty White's sister in this movie. And, of course, they do the whole tie-in with Betty White and everything. Great film. I highly recommend it, especially if you like the cheesy gator films. This is a definitely must-have. When you start getting the three and four, they get kind of goofy. What about five? Oh, Lake Placid versus Anaconda? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) How can you have a lake versus a snake? They should have put, like, (laughs) alligator of Lake Placid versus Anaconda. But anyway, uh, it's got some good CGI to it. There's a scene on the Blu-ray where they... uh, It's called... Uh, sex, Guns, and Croc and Roll. Where they actually... <laughs> yes, it's actually called Sex, Guns, and Croc and Roll. Where they're going through the playing of the movie, and they used a real boar in certain scenes, and then they took out and put a CGI boar in it. Same thing with a gator, too. What? So, yeah. And another special feature I had to say on this is Lake Placid 2, the nod-up version. When you watch it, it's all in fast-forward... Until the kills happen. And then the kills are normal. And then fast forwards again to the rest of the movie until the kills happen again. Wow. <laughs> fun they were having fun with the special features. See, that's the type of like, innovation and just like cool, kooky yeah. stuff that I like to see in special features. I'm going, what is this? So I started playing with it. And there's a way to survive a, an alligator attack on this. So, yeah, for special features, it's fantastic. For a movie, I have it again, if you love killer alligator films, crocodile films, 
this is a definitely must have. I would go a seven out of ten with this film. It was fun. Nice. I actually <laughs> have seen Lake Placid two, and honestly, like I did, I did enjoy that one as well. It was one of the better like made for sci fi channel movies. I, I think that I've seen all four, all five of them actually, which is hilarious. Uh, they get they do get pretty bad in the final chapter and, it's, and <laughs> but it's cool though is they stay right with the series yeah I like that there was continuity that the, I, that always impresses me if you want to make a cheap sequel if you have continuity I'm instantly like with you more than I would be all of them it's all <clears throat> continuity with all the movies yeah. which I thought was pretty good <laughs> so yeah that's Lake Placid two all right so get it get the unrated version <laughs> nice. Nice. Cool, cool. I guess uh, I will go next since Moods always likes to go last. And the film I alluded to earlier in the show, uh, Uncaged from 2016. Got a screener copy from uh, Image Entertainment. And yeah, this one uh, follows a teenager who uh, goes out to a cabin that is uh, this is not a cabin. It's really a house with his uh, two uh, teenage friends that his uncle kind of uh, – let him have for the weekend or the, I think it might be like seven days. And basically uh, one night he wakes up in kind of next to a dumpster and he's naked. And basically he's a, uh, he's turning into a werewolf. Now I will say right away the the thing that I actually liked about this one was the comedy. There, there's some comedy in it and it's subtle. Uh, it, you know, a little over the top. The characters, are, the characters just have this, this fun way of of talking, and they they say these like witty things to each other. And you know, they're, they're like the one character is just all about trying to get laid, and he he's using like the Tinder grinders or whatever the of the world is, and he he meets this one girl, and then the, the other character is like this kind of nerd. And he's like smokes weed for the first time or something. And then he's like, you know, I just smoked weed for the first time. Now I'm rolling a joint. So now this time I'm actually going to get high or something. Yeah, it was a funny line. And his joints are all just terrible. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm working on this. Um, the Actually, you know, the werewolf stuff isn't too bad either. He, there's, it's, he kind of straps a GoPro on him. Uh, and it kind of uh, just to you know figure out what's going on because he, he's just he doesn't know what happened when he wakes up you know typical werewolf stuff doesn't really add anything super new to the genre but I was super surprised at just how fun this one was considering I I literally had like zero expectations with this the cover like Mood said earlier looked pretty awful and honestly it, it, you don't really expect much from image most of the time you know because they have been known to release some very hit or miss films yeah not these days yeah yeah (laughs) uh you know every once in a while they'll release like an adam green film or something that's that's really good but yeah this one this one it's it's very simple there's not much to it it kind of does have a a little bit of um i guess i guess it kind of goes downhill a little bit towards the third act it just it just i wasn't really into it it was about people like uh you know what's really going on type stuff where there's people that are involved that are you know supposed to be maybe good guys or whatever you know that it's kind of like i wouldn't say plot twisty you can see it coming a mile away but it's just uh ulterior motives type type things but honestly you know i I can't say much about it because it is a pretty simple film i will say that the characters really the characters i thought the casting and the acting was good uh you know, I would say that the nerdy one kind of reminds me of like a McLovin type deal, with just this nerdy kid who's like trying to be a little badass, come out of his shell a little bit. The lead characters, all right. It honestly ran about an hour and thirty six minutes, and uh, it kind of it kind of didn't drag at all. Wow. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, not the best film in the world, but definitely a solid six point five out of ten. So that's the first film I watched in two thousand sixteen. And uh, not too bad. Ain't making a top ten list unless this year is awful. But you know, <laughs> it, it's a uh, it's it's definitely worth a pickup for five bucks. You know, I would I would recommend picking it up for five bucks. Uh, I was happy with it. Super surprised actually. So, yeah. yeah, I was joking to you earlier that uh, the the two. 2016 release films I've seen this year, I also rated 6.5. So, not the strongest start to the year. No, definitely not. <laughs> Oddly enough. All right, so um, 
first film I'm going to talk about tonight is a film from 2002, which take note of that year. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this film is called Cannibalistic with an exclamation point. <laughs> I, have, I, I love how it has this one. I, I love how it has the explanation point. It's fucking awesome. Um, basically, going into this film, I thought it was going to be like a shot on video film. I don't know why. Just the way it presented itself. It's not though. It's actually not shot on film, but or on video. But uh, it's basically about this guy named Will, who he had a tragic accident. He was going on a trip with his friends and he had a car accident and <laughs> one thing leads to another. And apparently he had to do everything in his power to survive. And he had to ultimately eat his friend to survive. Right. So he became a cannibal in this, in this, you know, this situation. Well, anyways, he's a city dweller. So he of course makes his way back to the city and, and he's having a hard time living in the city because there's so many people around. And the reason why he's having such a hard time for this is now he's got a he's got a lust for human flesh. So he figures the only way to kind of suppress his, you know, his lust for human flesh is to move out to the country to get rid of all, you know, all of his, uh, you know, there's not as many people out there. So he moves out to the country and he figures, well, yeah, it's the best place to be. There's not a lot of people. I'm very secluded and I can, you know, become a vegetarian and just kind of forget about being a cannibal. So he moves out to this country house. And of course, it doesn't really work out so well because his neighbors are very nosy and they keep coming around and bugging him. And, you know, he's really suffering from this, this, you know, this disorder <laughs> that he has being a cannibal. You know, there's scenes of him, you know, like literally laying in his bed, you know, just rubbing his stomach going, oh, I need this. And, you know, of course, his neighbors keep bogging him and one thing leads to another. He starts going crazy. Hence, he starts going cannibalistic. <laughs> so that's your synopsis to the film. Now, my thoughts on this one. It's very low budget. And at first I was like, oh, man, this movie. I don't know. Uh, but it's actually got this, like, really kind of strange charm to it. It's, you know, it's not a straightforward horror film. It's definitely got, like, dark comedy elements to it that are actually pretty funny at times, I have to say. You know, there's moments in the film where <laughs> like you just kind of shake your head and laugh and stuff, but it's not like it's not slapsticky comedy or anything. It's just kind of subtle, dark humor because it's a cannibal film. That's what he's doing. He ultimately starts killing people off and, you know, chopping them up and using his freezer as, you know, storing the meat and things like that. Um, it's actually quite a lot of fun. It's not a great film, but I did like how it all kind of developed and, you know, the way it goes down and things like that. It's actually surprisingly shot. Well, um, I don't really know anything about the director, James Felix McKinley, I think did this film or something like that. He, uh, believe, Oh, we actually no, He directed hyperthermia. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the movie hyperthermia, but like the dude the running around starts and, off like so good and instantly does the biggest nosedive in film history. <laughs> Because you see the guy running around in some rubber suit. Yeah, he's actually directed this movie. See, I don't is... mind the, the rubber suit. No, I, have you seen Hypothermia? Yeah, I have it. Oh, yeah, God. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think the movie. I think it's just. I think it's too goofy for itself. But anyways, um, but this movie is Hypothermia looks like a million dollar film compared to Cannibalistic. Um, but I do like a lot of elements of this film. I, I like. I said I like the dark comedy and you know the way it develops and stuff like that. And, you know, there's actually a, like a lot of story and, and character development, in this, which you would never think. It's kind of – it's an interesting cannibal film. You know, if you were to put this into the genre of cannibal films, it sticks out on its own. There's no other film like this. It's very strange. It's a very strange film. Um, Kind of enjoyable. It's not like overly that great. I wish the ending was – no, you know, I honestly, I did kind of like the ending – to be honest, it wasn't like the worst thing in the world, but I was kind of thinking it was going to go one way and it really didn't. But, um, you know, overall, not a bad movie. I'm going to give this one a pass at like five and a half out of ten. It's it's a unique cannibal film. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I think the biggest problem with this film, though, for myself is it was very self-aware that it wasn't trying to be like a bona fide, straight up, you know, you know, cannibal film. And it was dealing with like these dark humor elements and stuff is that they didn't really put a lot of effort in or emphasis into, you know, gore and kills and things like that. The kills are kind of off screen and, you know, there's not a lot of blood and gore and stuff. And, I, you know, I, I, it's very problematic when it comes to a cannibal film because you're a cannibal, you're eating people. <laughs> it should be bloody and gory, but I don't know, man, that was kind of like my biggest nitpick with the film. 
maybe ran a little bit too long too, but uh, you know, five and a half out of ten. It's definitely worth the watch. I mean, if you're really into this low budget stuff, I know JP will never check this one out ever. Uh, some people might give this one a shot, but it's it's okay. It's decent. It's it's better than you know shit. <laughs> well, uh, way, so. moods. Uh, the reason you're probably watching 2002 films is because we got a top ten coming up for 2002. Yeah. Uh, take it. This one's uh, probably top five material, huh? <laughs> No, not quite. Not quite. But I am glad that I watched it because it was a film that I'd never heard of from 2002, decided to pick it up. And, you know, it was it was tolerable. That's why I like I just, doing these top 10 shows of random ass years because it makes me yeah. check out films that I probably wouldn't have checked out anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like I said, it's it's a very odd cannibal film. Let's put it that way. So what was the rating on that? Uh, five and a half out of ten. Five and a half out of ten. All right. Back to you, Matt. Alrighty then. Um, <laughs> sorry. That was a little more Jim Carrey ish on that one. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'm not Jewish. Uh, let's see. My next film <laughs> is. Oh, man. Is from 2015. It got a, uh, the release Blu ray in 2016. And it is called Howl. H O W L. This is a fantastic werewolf film. It is, nice. a, it, it is a British horror movie. It all takes place on a train, which is pretty badass. Yeah, so it's got a cool little contained horror element to there it. There you go. Uh, Joe is a ticket taker who got passed for a promotion. He's got forced to work the late night shift. So they're on this train. He, he introduced a bunch of different characters, characters that you hate and characters that you love. Uh, something happens to the train. train stops. To, the conductor gets out. And something kills the conductor. Well, of course, you hear the howling, and you pretty much know it's werewolves. So it's werewolves on a train, pretty much. Uh, nice. Yes. Now, the werewolf itself is not your typical werewolf, which I love because this is so different. Uh, good, great gore. Uh, people getting torn apart. Cool uh, werewolf transformation. This would make a. This would make my. Uh, top 10 for 2016 because this came out. This is how great this movie was. It's mostly all practical effects except for the feet. The feet they used for the werewolves were CGI. So when you <laughs> see the, uh, yeah, when you watch the uh, special effects, there's people in green booties walking around. <laughs> uh, the werewolf, <laughs> the way I look at it as, is a werewolf in half transformation from a human to a wolf. It's got all the human tendencies, but the werewolf teeth, the eyes, uh, the fangs, but in almost like a werewolf type form. Now, l- let me ask you this, just so I can get a better idea of what I'm I'm looking at. So, I think there's three main types of werewolves. You have the very humanoid Wolfman, like from the yep. 40s. Then you have the animalistic Ginger Snaps esque werewolf, American Werewolf in London style. And then you have the bipedal, kind of humanish dog soldiers werewolf. Where are we at? If you take the dog soldiers werewolf, give them no fur and more human like traits, there you go. So you seen the movie Were? Yep. Kind of like that? Kind of like that. But these people are more tall. They got the hoof feet, they got the werewolf uh, claws, the wolf claws, and the wolf feet but more humanoid, like, no fur on them. It's like almost they're starting to tr- turn into a werewolf. Right, gotcha. But they're, fer- they're ferocious. Nice. This sounds good, and, man. Uh, it's, I, I was blown away. Like, I saw, I know you guys don't like trailers, but <laughs> I, watched the tra- I watched the trailer on it, and I'm like, wow, this looks solid. When it finally got, came out, I bought it right away, watched it, and I'm like, holy shit, this movie was fucking awesome. I watched it, like, three times already. We should actually start like a ticker count for every time you say that in the show. I know you guys don't like trailers, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys say it all the time. Like, I don't like watching trailers. I don't like. Well, I do. <laughs> we, we do put a lot of emphasis on that because yeah. I think it was just like such a devastating thing to us. It's like yep. ah, it's ruined, ruined. <laughs> you know, can't have a fucking movie ruined from that. But I give mad praise to you guys if you guys still want to watch trailers and stuff to newer films. But for me, I give this movie a nine out of ten. Nice, coming in with wow. a nine out of ten. Fantastic! Wow. You know, I've heard. Wow, you know, I've heard everything from complete shit 
to good to nines out of tens. Hmm. I actually haven't heard anything except for just a second you know, ago. It's weird because I actually just came across a conversation about it like a couple days ago about this movie, and mm-hmm. there was people saying it was shit, it was good, it was blah blah blah. So, but I'm always interested. I love werewolf stuff. So, all right, so I will get into my second and final film. I don't have any segment this week, guys, because I, I couldn't really find anything that would fit in. I could have did a pick of the week with a 2002 film or something, but I decided not to and uh, the film that i'm going to talk about for my second film i alluded to it earlier and that is martyrs got a festival release in 2015 (laughs) but technically is a 2016 film eligible for top 10 lists of 2016 so so is howl (laughs) okay okay uh martyrs the remake so very similar story pretty much exact story to the original martyrs film a woman and her childhood friend seek revenge on those who victimized and abused them. So, I don't really know how to review this film without directly comparing it to the original Martyrs. Simply because it is the same movie, but shorter, less gore, change up a little bit of stuff in the third act, and it, and that's it, man. Cool, man. Ratings. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the things uh, early on, you know, it, it moves at a much faster pace. Like y- you remember in the original Martyrs when shit hits the fan, a la shotgun, it, you know, it feels like it happens right away. Well, it even feels like it happens more right away in this one because oh. it, it even happens faster in this one. Uh, very little exposition in the pre 12 year later flashback in this one. Uh you you have even less time spent with the family, which already the time spent with the family was very short in the original Martyrs. Uh, but mm-hmm. there's even l- less character development in this one. They kind of switch things up a little bit. And it's like that throughout the film. You know how in the original, the mother's outside digging the hole or whatever for whatever they're doing with their pipes or whatever. This time it's the father. Uh, so they do switch things up a little bit like that. Uh, and then it just pretty and that's much the sole reason why this movie had to be remade was because of that scene. Yeah, right. <laughs> so then, man, if we did it with the father, that would oh, make it makes completely it so, different. It makes it so worth the admission. Ah, oh, yeah. So God. once the revenge takes place, it's kind of very similar, not as dramatic, not as powerful, because it's 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 faster cuts, it's less impactful camera shots where you know. In the original, it kind of stays on the dramatic moment. I'm trying to not spoil this. The dramatic moment of what happens when the revenge first takes place. Uh, This one uh, then moves into sort of the uh, aftermath of that. You know, the moving of things, the 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 sort of exposition between the two characters, the two uh, childhood friends. Uh, This one it, it moves very, very, very quickly through all of that. And then we kind of have the third act where, uh, you know, the reveals are happening, which honestly, the first reveal that happens, very, very badly done, uh, not as powerful at all. The second (laughs) reveal, the kind of main reveals where you see like what's really going on here, uh, those ones also (laughs) not as impactful. And all the way up until the very end where they switched it up a little bit, I actually wasn't too upset with how the very end happened but the problem is is it just didn't have the 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 punch that the original did because of the development that happened in the original doesn't happen in this one so by the time you get to the end yeah, the lack not... the lack of the lack of impact leading up to that final impact yeah you know, the, the devel- impact doesn't work the de- the, the, the development leading up to that final impact was not yeah. there. There's no, there's no development like we've seen it in the original. Hmm. Uh, honestly, it, it's been described as a tame version and, and that's literally what it is. It, 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 and honestly, when we talked about the news of this happening, that was kind of our speculation. Like, Oh, it's just going to be a watered down version, which I was kind of a little hesitant to believe because I was just, I didn't see that, that, you know, I felt like it would be stupid to do that. <laughs> And it really was. So 
I will give a few positive points. One, I thought that the acting was not bad. The the back and forth between the characters was all right. Uh, there are some. Well, that's that's kind of the main positive, actually, that the acting was all right. And there was one scene in the end that I thought actually kind of worked. They kind of flipped the whole final act in terms of, like, the characters and their interactions. Kind of, like, they really mess with that. The, it, it, a lot of things happen differently, kind of similar end result. But I, I, was, I was happy to see that they attempted to do something slightly different. However, you know, because there's no real development and no real power to what's happening, because that's what the original had so much to do with. It was just very, very powerful, dramatic, uh, painful stuff to watch. This one just doesn't have that, so that the, yeah. you can't really get the get the power in the end either. It's just fucked, man. And I started thinking to myself, like, well. Well, obviously we know it's a cash in, but who is there? Is there an audience for this film? Is there really one? And I got to think just last week I talked, I was talking to a coworker. She's 18. She likes horror movies. She's very, she's a novice in horror. She's seen some Bingo. stuff. She's seen Bingo. some stuff and she's seen, you know, some of the classics, some of the Wes Craven stuff, you know, some John Carpenter stuff. I talk to her all the time because it's really fun to nitpick or not nitpick, but like, uh, pick their brain as somebody that's so new to the genre. She's 18. Show your knowledge and, to her. Yeah, and that basically <laughs> – I recommended hey, her a bunch of movies. Next thing you know, she buys uh, I think 11 movies online on Amazon. She's never really bought anything online. So it's cool. I'm kind of you know showing her the ropes a bit. And uh, you know, I started thinking – I mentioned Martyrs too, and she's like, oh yeah, I've seen clips of that movie on YouTube and I, I didn't watch it because I'm not really into like any of the hardcore stuff and it just looked a bit too gross. And I started thinking like, this is the, this is the movie. This is who that's for is these like, is the, is the horror novices <laughs> or the people who are just casual horror fans in, uh, in America. And that's kind of the sole purpose of this film is not absolutely not for hardcore fans. Now I have to remove the original film from what this film actually is. So in terms of a film, say I've never seen the original. That, that has got to be hard to do. It is a little, it is hard to do. And I will say that it's not a badly made movie. It's, it's not, it's badly when compared to something that is so masterful of the original but it, in terms of just a solo standalone movie by itself, it's not poorly made. It is only when you compare it. And that becomes problematic when you try to rate and be like unbiased. So I really was able to kind of pull myself from it and look at the film. Like, what does it offer? What does it have? And I came in with a 6 out of 10 rating on this one. I will say that I recently just talked to Kyle and he, I actually found out that he came in on the same rating. So I think he kind of – I think that most horror fans will probably have that rating it, unless you unless you compare it and do the thing with the original. Well, I mean there's going to be so many people that are not going to be able to disconnect themselves from the original. Yeah, I've seen Jeremy's it's be a rating direct- was a 3 out of 10. Which is it's it's just not like unless you're literally you can't rate this film a three unless you you're comparing it which he was so I mean it makes sense but mm-hmm. it, it's it's just not a bad movie it's just a bad remake that's that's Martyrs guys 2016 huh. very disappointing <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much every kind of you know, soft quote that I read was true. Yep. And literally everything you probably expected is exa- it's, it's almost cookie cutter how you would expect. And I almost feel bad for the directors because what could they really have done that you get this script and what do you do with it? Uh, don't do martyrs, do something else. <laughs> yeah. How about not remake martyrs? I guess, man, I guess, but these guys haven't really done anything before that. So, <laughs> I mean, is this really the movie that, we, that needs to be remade? no, like, I, I'm i still baffled by this, why mo- a movie like Martyrs gets remade. I mean, we've the talked about it before, and all I can think Martyrs, is, is the, to put it into English. But when I'm saying the point of Martyrs, the film Martyrs, is yeah. completely missed in this film. And that's sad, because that's, oh, okay. that's what, like, Martyrs is more than just 
a movie that you just put images and stuff and words together like it it has a deep uh it runs deep you know it cuts deep and this film doesn't and it's very disappointing i don't know what else to say that's that's my final thoughts on it that sucks huh yeah i mean you know fear is confirmed <laughs> yep you guys were right once a fucking again yeah, I know. I, I'm glad yeah, it, I didn't it, put that in the intro. JP Martyrs won't suck or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, it, that's interesting too because you know. Oh, never mind. I'll I'll just leave that. But, um, yeah. So for this week, uh, I think I just made up a new segment. I, I think I might want to do one of these, and I'm gonna call this uh, uh, backslash, and it's just. You know where I review like a random slasher film, right? Not really that creative, I like but it. I like it. But but that's cool. But it is okay. <laughs> so this one right here is, of course, again from the year two thousand and two. Ooh, what a surprise, right? <laughs> See, I thought backslash was gonna mean like retro. No, backslash. Uh, it's, you know, backlash, backslash. Uh, yeah, just any any old slasher film doesn't matter. But this one particularly is from two thousand two. And <laughs> oddly enough, this one is starring Priscilla Barnes and Corey Haim, of all people. The homie. Corey, Corey Haim. Haim is in this film. I didn't even know it when I ordered it. I, I grabbed it. And I was like, I saw the cover. And I was like, oh, shit, Corey Haim's in this. That's fucking hilarious. Um, and it is called The Backlot Murders. Never heard of it. I'd actually seen this one floating around, you know, a few times. I just never grabbed it or whatever. And, uh, you know. To my amazement, it was from 2002, and I was like, shit, now I have to grab it. <laughs> got to check this out. But uh, it's got a very simple premise to it. It's basically about this band called, I believe, ooh, I think they're called the Wise Guys. That's what they're called. And they are like this new and upcoming band, and they're supposed to be like the next big thing. Like, you know, they're going to be the next rock band. Anyways, um, they are poised to make a uh, a music video, which is actually shooting at Universal Studios, like – um, on the location of like where the psycho house is and all that type of thing and stuff like that. Kind of cool. Cause they, there's a lot of horror references in the film to universal and the studio and in horror films in general. But anyways, basically what it is, Priscilla Barnes plays a character. She's their, um, she is their, uh, manager. She's their manager. And, you know, so she's setting up this whole shoot and stuff like that. So this band starts doing their music video and things like that. And of course, not only the band members and everybody else that's working on this set starts getting picked off by this this random killer, and that's your film. There's really not a lot of story to this at all. I mean, it does give you a little bit of backstory in the beginning, but I'm not going to give you that because it just seems ridiculous to do that. So my thoughts on this one. Now, I have to say, this movie would have worked a lot better <laughs> Let's start with some of the bad. This movie would have worked a lot better if they had dropped a lot of the comedic elements to the movie. Now, when I say that is because I love the setting of this movie. They really did shoot this, you know, like a universal and things like that. And it's like, you know, it's self-aware. Like they're shooting on these sets and it's supposed to be set. So you see like the psycho house and you see like these things and stuff like that. Kind of cool. You know, it's kind of cool. The setting is really cool and stuff like that. Uh, the setup is very generic to the movie, of course, with, you know, you know, you got some random killer killing everyone off in here. But like I said, you you get like a little bit of a hint of a story in the beginning of the film. But the thing that's funny about this film is Priscilla Barnes' character <laughs> as the manager. I have to say, you know, her acting performance in this film is just fucking hilarious. It's just so over the top and ridiculous, which feeds into the, the comedic elements to this movie. This movie would have worked a lot better if it was serious. Truly, it would have been a lot better film. Hence, the kills aren't that bad in this movie. Some gore, you know, there could have been a little bit more, but the killer looks fantastic. The setting's awesome. There's a lot of really good atmospheric scenes and well-shot cinematography in the film because they're on sets. It just looks good. It just naturally looks good. And, you know, that's part of the thing. There's this whole scene with, you know, the director of the music videos talking about fog and how much he hates fog. And, of course, he's a stereotypical, you know, gay director and things like that. They touch on those things, which is, you know, very stereotypical in these type of films, very cliched. But 
it's kind of funny how he's talking about this. And, you know, there's even scenes where he's talking about what type of fog he wants. But anyways, the point is there's a lot of fog in the film and it just, it adds this atmosphere and it really does work. But, you know, mixed in with this really awesome character or the killer with this really wicked mask and stuff like that. But the comedy brings down this fucking movie. It really, really does. There's a lot of hot chicks. There's, you know, the perfect amount of nudity and a lot of things that are going on. Uh, Corey Hames character, if you're wondering, he plays the guitar player in the band. Uh, doesn't really have a huge part in the film. Um, <laughs> actually, you can tell. I swear to God, like he is just smoked out or he's fucked up in this film or something because it's just I don't know. It's I don't know if it's a character he's playing, but he just seems really out of it in the movie. But then I was kind of thinking back. This movie came in 2002. That's about the time where he's real fucked up in real life. So maybe he actually was. Um, but not a bad film. Not the worst thing I've ever seen in the world. I just wish they had made this one serious. It could have been a lot better. Uh, it does have some twists and turns in it, which are pretty predictable, which is kind of a big downfall. Pretty big body count because there's lots of potential victims in this one. Um, but very kind of average in itself. And I just really wish this one was a little more serious. It would have been so much fucking better. I am going to give it a 5 out of 10, though. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. But, you know, it's got a lot of funny moments in it. Uh, kind of like chuckle funny moments. But I do like what they did with uh, referring to a lot of horror references. There's like full conversations about like Nightmare on Elm Street and, and Psycho. There's this funny ass conversation between this guy and this girlfriend and he's like, you know, have you ever seen Psycho before? And she's like, mm, I'm not sure. Um, is that the one with Anne Heche? Well, I actually lost my shit laughing right there. I thought that was pretty fucking funny. So, you know, I'm going to give it a mark just for that joke. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but five out of ten black backlot murders. Yeah, not a good start for the new series. Uh, yeah. I would be interested to see Corey Haim, though. Yeah, I mean... You know, like I said, he's he seems a little uh, – he seems out of it in the film. He seems very, well, that would very make out- sense. I did listen to the autobiography of Corey Feldman via audiobook mm-hmm. called Choreography. And uh, yeah. that is a very detailed uh, autobiography on Corey Feldman and mentions a lot with Corey F- Haim and, and his yeah. molestation uh, throughout his yeah. career and his drug abuse. Yeah, well, he, he literally does. I mean, I, I know he's playing like a rock band and, you know, generally those guys are a little smoked out and, you know, they're just, you know, they're rockers and stuff. But he seems out of place in this film. It, it really does. It just seems like he was just taking this job and it's like it is what it is. But this movie's definitely worth just seeing Priscilla Barnes performance in the film. It's like it's outrageous. <laughs> it's just outrageous. Um, if you guys are unfamiliar, Priscilla Barnes, she was in The Devil's Rejects, you know, as uh, as the mom. Mama Firefly. Uh, no. Uh, who is she in the film? Uh, shit. What the fuck is her name? Gloria Sullivan. Hmm. That's right. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, she's, you know, she's in the, the hotel room scene. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, cu- I couldn't think of the fucking name, but yeah. Anyways, that's Gloria Sullivan. She's super famous. She's been in tons of, tons of things, but just notable as the devil's reject, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I just – that one had potential, man. Had potential. I love the killer's mask though. The killer's mask was great. It really was. What was the rating on that one, Moods? Five out of ten. Five out of ten. I think just a lot of missed opportunity in this one. You know, I, I hate to repeat myself over, but I just – it suffered from too much kind of silliness at times. But What was it called again? My bad, dude. The Backlot Murders. <laughs> okay. That's why I didn't remember it. <laughs> yeah like i like i don't know how you guys didn't laugh at the Anne hayes joke man i thought that shit was funny as hell this is young st- yeah i like horror films oh you mean psycho the one with Anne hayes because i don't man. know who that is and it's the fucking she's the chick from the remake uh <laughs> gotcha because <laughs> she's like the stupid and this movie's 2002 you gotta remember this is only like four years after that movie right mm-hmm. so Anne hayes was the girl that uh dated ellen to- ellen Oh, cool. Yeah. So, anyways. But, yeah, disappointing. So. All right. That wraps up what we watched. That does wrap up what we watched. And, yes, getting into the featured review of the show, which we have not even mentioned once. Usually do mention it in the intro a little bit or, you know, 
yeah. passing by, whatever. Um, but we are going to be talking about a film from 2009. I originally played in the festivals. It didn't get released until 2011, mm-hmm. I believe, on media. And it is a slasher film, and it is called Sweatshop. Yeah, and I will say that the DVD cover has plenty of quotes on it from Dread Central, Bloody Disgusting, HorrorMovies.net, HorrorNews.net. I mean, they covered it with quotes. Oh, yeah, man, we got some good ones, man. The Sid Vicious of Horror Films, Bloody as Hell from Dread Central, Sex Raves and Freakishly, freakishly Brutacular Kills. I like that word. Bloody Disgusting. That's from Bloody Disgusting also, man. So you got some good ones on here, man. But, uh, yeah, Sweatshop. Uh, Sweatshop. We want to give a brief synopsis of this one. A group of friends break into an abandoned factory in order to throw an impromptu party. I'm going to add this in there. It's sort of a rave style party. Unaware that it is not empty as they originally believed. There's actually a giant hulking sledgehammer wielding beastly freak up in there killing motherfuckers. (laughs) Yep. And that's pretty much a setup to this film. Uh, me and Matt were talking a little bit pre-game about this film, and you know, basically the lack of plot in this movie. Oh, so many do- holes. Does it hurt it, or does it even matter? I don't know. I guess we'll be the judges of that. But uh, um, yeah, this movie has just a very simple premise to it. But yeah, there is quite obvious plot holes in this movie that are like they kind of like scratch your head moments, but at the same time, you almost forget about them because this movie is just so like in your face and just it's just gortastic you know you know what i'm saying i know what you're saying actually i don't know what you're saying care to share some plot holes yes for instance um this movie has of course a killer that they call the beast in this you know and you know these care these central characters go to this warehouse and they start getting picked off by this killer called the beast the weird thing about this movie is that you know i think after the very first kill in the film by which is actually cop. It's like the opening scene in the film. Um, you see that accompanying the beast, the guy who's wielding this huge hammer anvil Mm -hmm. weapon, which I might add is one of the coolest weapons in a slasher film ever. It's fucking awesome. Um, there's like these weird ghouls. Mm -hmm. Now I really need to understand where they came from or, why they're there because they really don't have a huge part well i'll tell you why they're there they're his victims <laughs> yeah i i you know i definitely established this you know okay so the girl gets killed in the, in the beginning he takes this girl but okay we see one girl get killed in the beginning of the film where does the other ghoul come from well he's probably been doing this a while exactly but how, why are they ghouls because it's supernatural I they were just like helpers <laughs> that like, was the only thing like, like i understand that, th- that we like we assume that they were obviously the victims and that's quite present there but how are they how, why are they coming back to life and why the ghouls like there's no explanation whatsoever well, the, for that the, there's it's one of those things where you assume that the uh, killer is supernatural just simply because of the the things that he's able to do yeah you mean like lift this like 500 pound hammer anvil yeah and you know not Die well, that's get that's, that's, that's a big ass dude, though. That's this what, guy's that's, a monster. That's what I kind of said. You know, I was like, you know, you kind of have to disconnect yourself from that. And it's like, does this really matter why these people are technically coming back alive? Because they're quite obviously dead. They're called. I think ghouls. it only matters if it's alluded to in the plot, and it doesn't make sense in the plot. But since they don't even touch on it, I don't think well, it they really don't matters. Really- it's, it's kind of funny because they showcase the ghouls, but they don't really utilize them. You know, the main focus is the killer. Like, the ghouls aren't just, like, you know, secondary and they're sidekicking to this killer and stuff. Like, they're just kind of there in scenes here and there. So you do kind of forget about it right away. Yeah. I, I don't you know, think it's, that it's really that. I, it's one of those things where it's like, this is what exists strange, in though. this story. Yeah. And you either roll with it or you don't. Yeah, it is strange, though, because it, it the whole film plays out like a very kind of stereotypical slasher film. It's this killer taking out people one by one, but it has ghouls in it. <laughs> it's it's kind of odd at times. But I, I mean, I honestly have no problem with it. I just think it's just one of those things that people might point out and be like, OK, 
they're coming back to life? Sure. Yeah. It, I mean, it doesn't break any of the rules that are established in the film because there really aren't any. So, I mean, that's one of those things where it's like if if they're not really breaking any rules, then I don't really consider it a plot hole. It's just something left unexplained. It's in any type of movie yeah. that leaves stuff unexplained. Like, true that. Since true in that. A, uh, but it's like definitely a plant. No. Of, it, I've been for sure. they were like yeah. hallucinating it because like, they're in this giant uh, – I don't know what kind of plant they're in. It's a I never, never thought of that. It, I never thought it's of like that. a steel mill. Yeah, like a steel mill. Like so maybe something was leaking through all the pipes and they're hallucinating the ghouls. And of course the killer is definitely there. But again, these ghouls are running around. They don't kill anybody, they don't really do much damage to people. So I don't know if it's like a hallucination of the ghouls or You know what, Matt? That's a really, really good point. I never thought of that, but just came to me. <laughs> you know, I didn't really I, think of that either. I never thought of that. I'm sure that's probably not what they were going for. I think maybe it's just one of those things where there's these random ghouls. In there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But get into the, you know, after the beginning scene in the film. Well, where... hold up. Stop on that beginning scene real quick because there's something of note there. Uh, do you know who the character Ghost is? The actor. Joe Lynch. Yes. Joe motherfucking Lynch. The homie that directed Wrong Turn 2, Everly, and disowned Knights of Badassdom. Yeah, I know. But Ian Holliston. Pretty cool, man. Yeah, I like it's Joe kind of Lynch, man. Too, right? Joe Lynch is right. cool as shit, in my book. And it's cool to see him in there playing a funny guy. So uh, I think something that's of note with this film, you know, that we could kind of get into because it is like a prime part of this film, is the uh, the types of characters we're dealing with. Uh, what would you consider these guys? Like rockers, punk rockers, goths, emos. I kind of, I kind of goths left rave, rave. Yeah, I kind of like you know gothic punk. They're almost like gothic kink type characters. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you. Know, like goth I got a lot of vibes of like Return of the Living Dead. Maybe that the director was influenced, the writer was influenced by like the types yeah. of characters that were written in Return of the Living Dead. Especially with the Scotty Boy character, kind of reminds me of the suicide character a little bit. Exactly. And the black guy kind of reminds me of the black guy from Return of the Living Dead. Exactly. Yeah, you, it, gothic punk is probably a great way to describe them because they kind of showcase both. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's pretty good. Um, when they introduced the characters, the freaking thing that popped in my mind was a video on YouTube. It's a bunch of, like, uh, goth punks dancing under a bridge. And someone sped it up and played the freaking Thomas the Train theme song to it. I laughed <laughs> my ass off. And I just I just see this. I'm going, fuck. Freaking Thomas the Train just came to my head. Hmm. <laughs> if you ever watch... <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, that's good, man. But, you know, speaking on the characters in this film, um, you know, they're obviously very undeveloped characters. It's just, they are what they are, you know. But I, th- they- I think they have a little bit of uh, legs compared to a lot of uh, slasher films because they kind of all have their thing that they're doing. There's like a. Well, they have their jobs. They have their jobs within, you know, what the film is, you know. But there are you- subplots to, to most of-, of the characters. Of course, of course, Which, you know, but those are, but those are more almost personal beefs. There's not development in characters. Those are just kind of like more like personal beefs with each other, you know, and oddly enough, the beefs that these characters do have with each other, it seems like for the most part, most of the characters in this film are like likable. Yeah, I, agree. you know, like, it, it's kind of weird. Like they have personal beefs, but maybe there's one girl that's really a piece of shit. Um, but you know, for the most part, the, the characters are what we call kind of stereotypical, but they're likable. They're likable, stereotypical characters. And it really kind of made me laugh that this movie setting is in a warehouse. And the point is they're throwing a rave party and the DJ's black. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, the token black guy is the DJ. That's funny. Like you have to, like, that is pretty funny, man. So the, you know. uh, you know, again with the, uh, I feel like this film, sort of references or not references but maybe was inspired by other films uh the kind of the fat guy kind of reminds me of stooge a little bit from night of the demons yeah yeah except for this guy which we had to discuss it's probably the only fat hillbilly guy to get more pussy than any of the good looking skinny guys (laughs) in a fucking slasher film yeah that's that's a very unique thing to this movie yeah 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 (laughs) 
<laughs> kind of strange, but yeah. So, I mean, I actually had a lot of fun with the characters. I think everybody has a decent personality and they have a story. I, I was, you know? I think that's one of the main notes that I take away from this film. And this is my second watch. I did watch it a few years ago and I really liked it back then. And I wasn't expecting it to really hold up. And then on rewatch, I see that, Hey, like these characters, considering the low budget, considering that it's a stereotypical slasher, they're much more, I guess, they have much more depth to them than you would ever expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it, it probably has a little bit to do. I, I mean, I've heard people say that this one suffers from taking too long to start. And, you know, I, I take note of these things and like, you know, you have your opening scene and then about 33 minutes in the film is when you get your first kill. Well, first, you know, killer kill, you know, and I don't think that's really a long time, you know, to start a, to get things going. Do you guys agree? Is that too yeah, long? Yeah, because I mean, honestly, bro, and if I'm being 100% honest, I don't even think that that's my favorite part of the film is the kills. Like, I genuinely enjoy these characters and watching them interact. Yeah. So um, to me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, man. Like I, I don't, I mean, I don't really connect myself with the characters too, too much. I do like what's going on with them. I, I, you know, I think they're, they're decent characters and not shitheads, but at times in this one, I mean, you know, especially in the third act, like, I, I mean, cause we don't know any of the people, but I just want to see kills, man. It's just one of those things. I just want to see kills, but yes, I don't know. I, like, I think for me I in think this the, one is okay. Go ahead. I, I just think that, you know, once you see one kill in this film and then he kind of switches it up and I want to see how he's going to kill people is essentially what I'm looking for in this film because you know that there's something special with the kills, you know, the type of kills and the type of gore that's being presented to us. So it becomes kind of like, okay, there's a lot of characters in this film. That means that there potentially could be a super high body count. So mm -hmm. at times in this film like this, I'm kind of rooting for the killer a little bit because I know that there potentially could be a fuckload of kills. Mm-hmm. I'm weird like that because, you know, it's it's like. Slated. Yeah, I, I, no, I understand. I, I like kills as much as the next guy. But uh, to me, like, I do hear a lot of people say, like, how awesome the kills are in this film. And really, my f my one main awesome kill is the jaw rip. And, you know, some of the sledgehammer kills like through the fence or th on the table. I, I don't like those type of kills. Honestly, I think they're too cartoony. Oh man! You got a giant anvil coming at you. It's gonna do some damage. Being yeah, it's not gonna against something. Fucking <laughs> that's awesome. Body well, that, that, a fucking uh, chain link fence. <laughs> Just not. That's not how physics work. Yeah, well, but I mean, you know, again, gets... you have to disconnect yourself, though, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just. But like, that's cool. what I'm saying. It's like cartoony. I, like, I've never been a fan of those over over the top kills like that. The jaw rip one, yeah, I mean, it's unrealistic, but it looks so goddamn good. I never liked the watery blood anyway, where it looks like it's just red water. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So th that's another thing that that bugs me about certain kills, but. I'm definitely down with the kills. Like, I, I but they mix them up quite a they bit. They do. In this, right? They do. I mean, there's even a little torture porn going on in here. Oh yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> with the fat guy and his dick. But yeah, and the uh, chick in her fingers. And the chick in the finger, which is totally awesome, right? He mm, just like, takes the really time to good, do that. I know it really, it really does, they, man. They do I, this weird effect in this film where when there's a kill, they almost blur the camera, or they like make it like like shaky or mo it's like they do this weird thing. That I noticed in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It got yeah, some of the flaws, I bet. Yeah, uh, probably, probably. I mean, there's filters on the film too, right? So they yeah. why not put that in there too? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's one thing I love about this film is you know the different type of kills and stuff. Even though he's using this huge anvil, he is definitely killing people in different ways. Like when he smashes the chick's head on the ground and like totally demolishes it. Mm -hmm. I love that kill. Yeah. Like, it looks good. Like, the gore yeah. is good. And speaking of gore effects and stuff, Marcus Koch actually did the effects on this film, worked on this film. So if you're familiar with Mar Marcus Koch, he's worked on tons of, you know, low-budget indie films and things like that. But he's got quite the name for himself. So, of course, the effects are going to be decent. But, you know. I like the one scene where you're actually looking through the killer's visor. Mm -hmm. And it's all, like, red, blood red. And it's, like, a little square. The welding like, mask, yeah. Yeah, you're looking, actually looking through the welding mask. And you're seeing the kill. You're seeing him kill the girl or getting close to the girl. Yeah, nice, oh, yeah. nice POV cool. shots that adds a little dimension to the to the both the killer and the film. Uh, I think that this film kind of works on a lot of levels in terms of its style. The the idea that they take these 
we'll just call them goth rockers. And, you know, they kind of really center it around that. Goth there's, rocker there's, ravers. There's some good, like, <laughs> again, with Night of the Demons, I think that this film was definitely inspired by, like, Return of the Living Dead and Night of the Demons. The, oh, the chick time. dancing in the fog mm-hmm. and the the different, you know, fluorescent lights oh, and the neon. It kind of reminds you of, um, you know, both Trash from Return of the Living Dead and yep. Angela from uh, Night of the Demons, obviously. Uh, another thing that I thought was pretty decent in this film, not a huge fan of, I don't even know what you would consider this kind of music, but I thought that the soundtrack was pretty good, and it's actually done mostly by two bands, and that's Lucid Dementia and Android Lust. I actually used one of the songs, Deadly Sally, in one of my many shots, played the whole song, and I got it from this film because of, uh, you know, I, 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 it was memorable to me. I absolutely love the fucking soundtrack. I love synth scores like this. I love that, uh, you know, that kind of older, you know, electronic um, mm-hmm. industrial type music and stuff. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, that's that's the. It, this is pretty much kind of like later of it. Like it, it really evolved in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s or whatever. And this is kind of like the re, you know, kind of resurgence of it. Mm-hmm. But these bands did a good job, man. It's kind of funny because the theme song, which is called Creep is very kind of reminiscent of the theme song from Terror Vision. Uh-huh. That there's an yep, element mm-hmm. in there and I swear it's a fucking sample from Terror Vision. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it's you almost so expect damn... it to be like Terror Vision. I know, but it's like it's like creep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say creep and I'm just like, fuck it's Terror Vision. It's like But yeah, I, na, 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 I love <laughs> absolutely love the soundtrack in this movie and it really just keeps it kind of flowing in the film right yeah, and the music it feels changes very quite natural. often it feels uh very it does it fits the characters which by the way yeah. i like the look of these people they felt very authentic in terms yeah. of like what these types of people look like you know mm-hmm. i i think one of the ways that i was maybe able to connect with the characters a little bit more is I had some neighbors who were very much like this, and they always threw parties, and I would go down to their house, and I would always party with these like people who look like this. And for the most part, they were all really cool. Some of them were obnoxious, like the Scotty character. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of really brought back memories of these like almost rave parties that I used to go to. And uh, I really liked that about it. it, it you know, it kind of uh, connected with it on that level maybe more than most people would. Yeah, man, hot chicks too. Oh yeah, uh, I, I know we were talking about you know well, I think uh, was it Scotty the guy is he the one with the Mohawk and yeah, about yeah. names? Anyways, hit the girl that he's you know doing his thing with. That girl is super hot in the film. The one with the the kind of the big dreadlocks or whatever. The fishnets. That's my chick too, man. Yeah, that dude, that's my chick. that's the girl. I could. Well, I was the girl in the beginning. There, lollipop there uh, with yeah. those green eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh damn. The, the shaves, uh, the sh- uh, shaved head. Oh yeah, sides she, and stuff. she's, yeah. she's yeah. good too, man. And uh, it, honestly, even uh, Jade, who kind of has a more interesting look to her, she's not the most hottest girl in the world, but she she kind of was a little sexy there at times too. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The chick with the dreads, man. I was saying before that uh, uh, when me and Matt were talking. It, I, I was I was looking at her and I couldn't figure out who the hell she was, but she's actually the lead uh, character from Cherry Bomb, mm. that revenge film. Not very good film, but yeah, she went on to do that. So yeah, she's yeah. definitely she's definitely my favorite chick. She's definitely even like the stuff like she just has a sexy talk to her. You know what I mean? I think her acting was probably the best out of everybody's as well. Mm. And that's one thing about the film. I don't think the acting overall is that bad. No, nah, you know for nah, for a super not bad at you know, all. For a low budget film, I think they did a pretty good job with the casting. Everyone looks authentic. I think the acting was decent. Everyone pulled off their characters. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, which is is good. That's a good thing. You know, back you know? in the back in the day when I watched this, you know, I picked it up after hearing it on somebody's top ten list. It actually made their number one of the year on a podcast I listened to back in the day, which is obviously wow. not ever going to happen with me or anything. But you know, I I picked it up i watched it i reviewed it back on my youtube channel and i remember just digging it so much that i actually went and listened to the commentary and i don't really remember much about the commentary but i do remember that i really liked it and they kind of filled in some details on on some stuff but i I literally you know i'm talking we're talking four or five five years ago by now probably yeah you know this is one movie that i've stated many times you know when i'm watching a you know a horror film and 
maybe it has like a heavy metal soundtrack. You know, at times when you're watching those films, it just feels like you're watching so like a music out of video. Place and it's just yeah, like and too it, loud it feels like, and obnoxious. Yeah, the music and it just feels like you're watching a music video, and you're just like, oh god. You know, there is times in this film where it feels like you're watching a music video, but it's actually good because yeah. the cinematography is good, the music's good. It feels appropriate because of the setting and what mm-hmm. they're supposed to be accomplishing in this film. A rave. It feels appropriate. It feels and like a rave. They actually captured a lot of that, and they did it well. It, it, you know, it, to some people, it could be like, oh, they're just filling up the moments, but not really. That's exactly what you would do. And if you're setting this up, you're getting in the mood, you're listening to music, you're dancing, you're feeling it out, and it's being captured right in front of your eyes. Yeah. And it's, it, I think they did a really good job, um, which leads me into the actual look of the film. I think the cinematography in this film is really good. I think there's a lot of really unique shots mm-hmm. at times. Mm-hmm. I think this movie looks very good i like the filters that were used on it i think the lighting was very appropriate considering you know they use the strobes and stuff like that but they're in this building where it doesn't really have a lot of lighting it's very dark but they lit it appropriately Mm -hmm. you know it just it has that perfect look to it it's not overlit it's not underlit it's shot very very well love the look of this film it has a very natural 80s feel to it which they never tell you you know that it's supposed to be set in the 80s or anything you know of course it's not because you know cell phones and things like that but um but it it, it kind of has throwback. that throwback it, it is definitely a throwback and it does it naturally but not letting you not throwing shit in your face every five minutes you know it has that very natural approach to it and i fucking love that about this movie it has it has so much replay value for me just because based on that I, you know natural feeling i'll tell you right now man this this movie to me is exactly what I look for when I when I watch an indie film. Super, definitely super low budget, right? This thing probably yeah. had such a tiny budget. Uh, really unknown people. Really, none of them went on to do much. A couple of them did a couple films. Uh, even the director didn't do much, which t- really is a shame, you know, because I, I yeah, thought yeah. that this was definitely <laughs> actually speaking only characters that like in the, of the film, it says introducing, a- introducing, introducing <laughs> Ashley K. And so I looked her up. Yeah, she hasn't done anything since this movie. Yeah, I even looked up. Our, <laughs> uh, I looked up a couple of the chicks that I liked. They really haven't done anything. But uh, yeah. I'm looking at the IMDb here. Twelve thousand dollar budget. I mean, when you have this, you shouldn't have any. Like whenever I hear people say like, oh, well, it only had a $50,000 budget. It's like that's not a good excuse to me because you got films like this grand. and you yeah. got films like The Battery. I mean it's never an excuse to me for, for budget. Don't tell me because I don't care. You know, Don't tell me how low the budget was. I don't, I don't care. This is a good film and, you know, and that has nothing to do with it. I mean obviously I'm sure that it could have been better with a higher budget but – I mean, they did great. They did great. And, you know, mm-hmm. I would think mm-hmm. that this film would have a much higher budget. Yeah. I mean, it definitely looks a lot bigger than, you know, what did you say? $12,000 budget? Yeah. Is that what it was? That's it really blowing my mind right now. That's crazy. That's crazy. It doesn't look like a low budget either, even though when you watch certain low budget films, you're like, oh, it's going to look like a fucking hand cam or uh, some camcorder. This actually was shot really well done. It's because it's also edited well, too. Yes. You know, it's got it's got decent continuity in it and you know, it's just edited decent. You know, like some low budget films, I find that like sometimes the editing is just oh my god, it's just instantly you're like, Well, wow, that movie costs like twelve dollars to make. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, this it's, one doesn't yeah. have that feel. It just it feels good. Uh uh-huh. yeah. it, it's one of those things, man. I, nobody got paid in this film. Twelve thousand dollars, you're not paying actors. You're not yeah. you're probably not paying special effects guys. They might even be using their own supplies, Marcus Koch. And, yep. you know, the director, I doubt he made much off of uh, whoever put this out, Alliance. I don't even know who that is, but I doubt they gave him much for it. Hence why he probably hasn't went on to do anything else. It, it, to me, it's like this is this is indie at its finest for me. Like mm-hmm. just just a solid, independent horror film that, that yeah, sure, has its flaws. I mean, the, like we said at the beginning, stuff's unexplained. But at the end yeah. of the day, I mean, this is a fun slasher film. But like I said, though, you know, with those, you know, what we call plot holes or whatever, it doesn't even really matter because everything else that's going on in this film is so well done and exciting that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The main focus is not on where are these ghouls coming from. Yeah. Your main focus is, yeah, like who the fuck is going to die next and how? <laughs> you know, like, you know, 
this is one of those films that's so exciting because there's literally 10 on screen kills leading up until the third act and every screen, every kill is on screen and it's, it's good. It's unique. There's some unique kills and pretty cool stuff. And then the third act hits and it just goes ape shit awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, I heard okay. one person say that I never understood how that, you know, how all these people got in there and started dancing and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, the music was already playing, even though the DJ was probably dead at this time. It doesn't matter. The music was already still playing. Well, people were there coming there anyways. It was that time. People showed up. Mm-hmm. So what are they going to do? They're going to come in and they're going to start dancing, do the thing. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Why are you dwelling on this? That's when shit goes ape shit. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. It's 13 yeah, it on-screen is. kills in that scene for a total of 23 on-screen kills that are brutal, bloody, and awesome. This is a fun film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the the co-writer of this film actually went on to write We Are Still Here, which was a nice hit from uh, 2015, made a lot of top ten lists. Made mine. And uh, I actually... Finally, I, I finally watched that movie, too. It was really good. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it, it definitely definitely was decent. And I believe that guy actually uh, tweeted at me, too, and was like, hey, you know, I hope you enjoy my movie. Worked, uh, you know, really hard. And yeah, he it was him. It was him. Uh, he said, I hope you enjoy my little melodramatic ode to Weirdo's 70 Zero Horror. We put a lot of heart into it. So, I mean, this guy surfs the net, checking to see if people's watching his stuff. And, you know, he thanks him for doing so. Checking out his work. Thank me. He didn't thank me. I had it rated higher than you. Did you tweet it out? <laughs> fucking bullshit, man. This is bullshit. <laughs> Just fucking around. Yeah, I mean, do you guys have much more on this one? They um, say that the the killer was also the associate producer too, so he helped mm-hmm. fund. This is the, this is that filmmaking where everybody gets involved. Everybody does multiple jobs because there's no money to hire people. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I you know I mean just last thing. I think I did say the killer, but uh, it's just I love the look of the killer. You know, the welding mask, huge, ridiculous weapon. So awesome. The the only it, complaint I have with the weapon great. is sometimes it comes with the acting. It's, it looks like he's holding something super lo- – like you can tell it's like foam at times just by the way he, he holds it. I, like, I, I remember you saying that back, you know, a couple years back when you'd watch <laughs> That was that one was of the, my critiques, like, yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know what? I do see that at times, uh-huh. you know, kind of if you're – I think, you know, if you're kind of looking for it. but. Uh-huh. Because I, you know, you mentioned that tonight. I started looking for it, but there was a couple scenes where, you know, actually, I think it's a scene where he busts the chick's legs through the fucking table or whatever, mm-hmm. and you can see him kind of like break his, not break his back, but he kind of bends his back and he he kind of puts some oomph into it, and it does look like it's heavy in that yeah, scene, and and like the yeah. way he does it. So and I'm like, I believe okay. even in my original review, just I said at times it looks yeah. like he's holding a paper mache mallet or yeah. whatever you want to call it. But he, he does that good wind up. But a lot of times, those people that are like laying on the ground, like during the the third uh, scene there, when, during the big the third the act, rave to the, the third act there on the, the dance floor, the, yeah. the dance floor, you got this gigantic Hulk with this gigantic mallet coming at you. <laughs> you're sta- you're laying there screaming. He does the <laughs> wind up. It's like um, I could have probably gotten up by now or. Roll over. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but Or they just stand there and scream and all of a sudden he's doing the wind up and there's the burp yeah. right at the top. <laughs> but they're great. <laughs> I was a little surprised that like your final girl in this film because she, she's not set up like final girl that you no, expect. Oh. No, she to- she totally isn't. And it's kind of funny that she's probably the most disliked character. Yeah. In the film, yeah. it's just kind of funny. It never really works out like that, so it kind of breaks a little bit of you know stereotypical slasher tropes a little bit. Where you just wouldn't expect that. Yeah, you just wouldn't expect. But it does have the obvious ones, like I said, with the black DJ. But also too is with the ending. <laughs> that makes too, me laugh. When yeah. um, the ending is what everyone would do. You, you would run away. Do you guys yeah. see the post credit scene? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> funny stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> Surprisingly Whoa. well-written dialogue up in this one, too. Yes. Some good dialogue. Surprisingly good dialogue. Yeah, not bad. Not bad, actually. Not bad. So. Ratings. You guys I, I guess we're, pro- yeah. we're probably done with this one. I mean, wow, we actually talked about Sweatshop for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's crazy, man. One Hammer... 
no prisoners. <laughs> it's hammer time. <laughs> Could you imagine <laughs> if they actually threw in an MC Hammer track? Oh, that would have been fucking good. Just for a minute. Just kind of mix it in there. <laughs> oh, it's been great. <laughs> All right. So newcomer, Matt. How about you start with the ratings? All right. For Sweatshop, I would probably give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Cool. Moods, you next. Um, Yeah, man. I Fuck, dude. I, I love the shit out of this film, man. I think it's good. I mean, like you said, great indie filmmaking. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. This is what you want from an indie film. But it's still an indie film, and, you know, it's... It's an indie film. <laughs> so, I don't really know what that means, but uh, for lack of better words, I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. I really enjoy this film. I think it's fantastic. Love watching it. Yeah. Like Mood says, it is an indie film. And uh, more so, it is an indie slasher film. And uh, let's be honest. I mean, slasher films have problems. They, they're, they're you know very predictable. Characters wander off when they shouldn't be. The people don't hear screaming from other rooms and stuff like that. I mean, there, there's all the slasher. Doesn't anybody realize tricks. that there's everyone's getting killed right, right underneath their nose? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, they're actually. But the, it's kind of funny. We didn't bring this up though. But there's one scene in the film where it's so it's self aware. It's like the girl comes out. And she goes, "Where the hell is everybody?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, a little late, baby. I just can't believe how much I actually enjoy this film where I would actually watch it again like very soon and yeah. I never do that. I never really do that. And I honestly love this film. I, I really do. It's one that I always kind of remembered as being awesome. Wasn't expecting it to be awesome on rewatch, but it was. It was. I liked it more probably. And uh, I give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Same as Matt. What a surprise. I'm highest in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a great one to throw on late night, man. You just turn it up and you got that great soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And Hot chicks. Hot chicks. You can't go wrong with this, man. Good gore. Fun kills. By the way, though, dude, uh, I'm pretty sure that Miko would be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Even my wife's going, I don't think so, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually you know i gotta say man oh dude her death brutal yeah yeah brutal <laughs> Probably the let's most. just say she gets hammered pretty well <laughs> it's fucking it actually oh fuck i was laughing at that it's good it it's looks good like stuff. they picked up all these people out of an insane clown posse concert <laughs> pretty much yeah i was dying laughing with scotty boy there talking about you know the man juice should only be on the girl. Oh, dude, that, that's what him. I'm talking about, about good dialogue, man. That was some funny, tropey shit right there. Because they, they set it up at the beginning. This, this, see, oh, yeah, there's oh, more dude, to this film. Oh, dude, that's so funny. Because that's he's so with funny. her and Miko. This is, <laughs> he's like, no, this no. Is, this is appropriate structure. You set the joke up at the beginning of the film. You yeah, talk yeah, about it briefly, and then it comes full circle. This is That's that's above amateur level. You didn't level. say it comes full circle. It does. It comes <laughs> full circle. In the mouth. All over the back. That's hilarious, yeah. man. <laughs> that's the not amateurish, guys. That's just not. No, it's actually, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. And when Scotty Boy's talking to his brother, he goes, the snowballer was so-and-so, and he's like, that's my wife. <laughs> but yeah, she only swallowed that. I fucked her in the ass. Yeah, well, first he's like, it. he's like, you fucked my wife. And he's like, no, no, I didn't fuck her. She 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 gave me a blowjob, and then she tried yeah. to kiss me, and then I was like all grossed out, so I fucked her in the ass. And he's like, what? <laughs> No, he's like, I tried, she tried to spit it in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking gross. Which, by man. the way, fuck all that. I'm with that dude. Ugh, yeah. that snowballing shit? Shit. Nope. That's disgusting. <laughs> Can't believe that's a real thing. Ugh. Ugh. But that is going to conclude episode 71 of the 22 Shots of Moods and Horror podcast. Matthew, I want to thank you for stopping by. And you know what, buddy? You're welcome back anytime. Great job. Thank and thank you for having me. I had a blast. This was awesome. Awesome. That's good to hear, man. That's really, really good to hear. So Yeah, and Matt, by the way, man, you're you're you do a good job too. You know what I mean? Like it's it's always, you know, a little shaky when you when you have guests 
but I knew you would be good because you were good on the show that we did together. And, uh, you know, definitely want to have you back possibly Absolutely. for like Let a summer show or something, you know, we'll, we'll have you oh, back. Oh, hell sure. yeah. I do want to apologize if, uh, if you know, you felt like I cut, uh, like I cut you off too many times. That's just how I am. Oh, no, it's, <laughs> I, I, I feel it bad takes too, a little while. I kept saying, I'm sorry. No, sorry. no. It, yeah. It, you never have to say story, man. It's just, you just kind yeah. of pause and go. Pause and go. It, it takes a little while to get used to the timing and stuff. Me and Moose are usually pretty good, but we even cut each other off. Uh, so, you know, no shame in that. It happened almost yeah. – unless you're talking in the same room, it happens on every podcast. Yes, it does. Yeah. I mean you listen to Killer POV, man, and those guys are all – like sometimes They're in the same everyone is too. everyone's talking at once and it's like you almost have to like rewind it to like get everything that uh-huh. they just said because it, it is clear. <laughs> it's like super clear and you kind of have to like pan through it and – yeah, yeah. And so. you know what? They they record in the same studio as Adam Green and Joe Lynch, the uh, Geek Nation. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. I was listening to one of their episodes just a little while ago, and I guess the studio was broken or something. Something was going on there. Oh shit! I've, I'm, a, well, rec- I'm a few episodes back. They had to fucking record at one of the dude's houses. <laughs> they were like at the house recording, but I was like, "That's what we're doing. We're in three separate, you know, cities and countries. Well, not three separate countries, but yeah. those guys are lucky as fuck, man, to do it like read together in the studio. Mm-hmm. That would be awesome." Uh, it would be so cool. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Maybe if we could get a quote, we'll hit the big time. Yeah, we get a quote, man. We can uh, we can move to the big city of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. I don't know why I said. <laughs> hey, whatever, <laughs> I, man. It's kind of central. It's kind of central for us. I, I mean, I could book it down. You guys can meet up, and we could just you know do the show. I have no idea. I had a blast this. on this one, guys. I think we covered a lot of good stuff. A lot of fun times, good good topics, good conversation, good reviews. Seems like no technical difficulties this time. Yeah, it was it went good. You know that that I mean that's kind of the nice thing about recording late at night. I mean probably not for you guys super late where you are, but three twenty one in technical, the morning. It seemed to have less technical difficulties when it's at night. That's than true. It is in the daytime. It's kind of strange how that works, but. Yeah, but again, that is going to conclude this episode 71. We'll be back next week with episode 72, and it is going to be a fucking huge one. So if you want to know what it is. That's what she said. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah. And if you guys want to know, it is going to be the Howling franchise. Boom. (laughs) Yes, we are. Kyle. Kyle is dropping by, and we actually had to, we had to coerce him a little bit into doing it because. Say we twisted his arm. We twisted his arm a little bit because, you know, if you guys know, of course, he did the uh, Children of the Corn franchise with us. And he said after that, he's like, fuck, I'm not doing any more franchises with you guys. You guys are nuts to watch that many movies in one week. But he's on board for the Howling. And you know what? He's kicking our ass. Yeah, the he's balls right deep in Howling right now. <laughs> he's like way apart. He's way ahead of us right now. So, But I'm really looking forward to another franchise shows. Some of my favorite ones to do. So be on the lookout for that next week. JP, you want to take us out of here? Absolutely, Moods. And in doing so, I'm just going to tell you guys quickly where you can check us out. 22ShotsMoodsAndHorror.com. That is our website. You can find our ratings there. Everybody always says, hey, you guys should cover this. Guy, we already covered it. Check the ratings. Scroll down. You'll see if Moods talked about it, if I talked about it, it's all alphabetical. You'll even see what episode it was on. You can click it, link, take you right there, and it'll tell you in the show notes exactly when we talk about it. So how about that? The next thing you can do is check us out on Horrorphilia.com. This is our new home, and this is where our iTunes feed is located. Uh, you know, Horrorphilia is doing big things, signing us, and uh, a lot of great other podcasts on there, such as the Exploding Heads podcast with Dave Z, Brandon, Orlack and uh, Christian. So check out them guys as well. ABC's a horror. That's a new one on there. I've been digging it. Listen to their first two episodes. You guys should check it out as well. Next up, we have facebook.com slash group slash 22 shots podcast. That is where it's at guys. Check it out. We have tons of great debates conversations news gets posted there you will not regret joining that group page twitter 22 shots podcast i'm doing a 365 day challenge on there listen off my horror films that i watch and give them some ratings email us 22 shots of moods and horror at gmail.com again itunes subscribe rate review and finally you can check our youtube pages double shot j mood 616 you and your horror movies voicemail 724-426-6665 body bags as well peace
Gia. Yeah!